for a written transcript of this meeting or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the Clerk to the Commission's office at 404-612-8232. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to this, the first of 92 regular meetings of the Board of Commissioners. Uh, it is 12, strike that, 10, 12 a.m. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Rob Pitts. Present. Commissioner Bridget Thorne. Commissioner Bob Ellis. Present. Commissioner Dana Barrett. Present. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Present. Commissioner Marvin Arrington, Jr. Present. Commissioner Khadija Abdul-Rahman. Present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Please, please rise for the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we get to the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm often asked why, why I uh, rush through the Pledge of Allegiance. I really don't, but I'm a stickler for grammar, and if you, if you notice, there's no comma after under God. That's why. Let us pray. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thy presence this morning. We thank you for a new year of life, health, and strength. Bless now those who are assembled, continue to guide and lead these commissioners. Give them your strength and fortitude to always do what is right. That at the end of the day's work, the greatest good would have been done for the least of these. It is your name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Madam Clerk. On page two. Consent Agenda 
0.0001, adoption of the consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered routine by the county commission and will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion will take place on these items. If discussion of any consent agenda item is desired, the item will be moved to the regular meeting agenda for separate consideration. All right, anything, Madam Clerk? Commissioners, any items on the consent agenda to be removed? If not, we entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve by Commissioner Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Cast your vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have an item requested to be added to today's regular meeting agenda, 23-0023, Dream County Facility Update. Okay, uh, for items to be, for, for the benefit of the two new commissions, for items to be added to the agenda after the official agenda has been published, made public, it requires a what's called a super majority. It means five affirmative votes if there's an emergency. Now the question here, what's the emergency? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. What we would like to do is, uh, since we had 16 facilities impacted by the winter weather and four still remaining closed, we'd like to give the board an update on those four as well as the public in terms of their projected reopening. Okay, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Please vote. I'm sorry, Commissioner Abdul Rahman, you want to be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, let's vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. Bottom of page five, regular meeting agenda 23-0010, adoption of the regular meeting agenda with the added item. All right, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Commissioner Ellis, you want to be heard? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know. Uh, our first item is um, budgetary discussion. And I know we've got two items that may be somewhat related that might be useful to hear before we have the budget discussion. Um, and that would be item 0021. Um, Remarks from Sheriff Labatt and uh, potentially item I'll defer to uh, to you, Mr. Chair, since you brought this forward. Item 1003 may have budgetary implications. We might want to hear those before um, item 0015 at the top of page 7. Okay. Uh, any objections to moving those up before the budget discussion? All right. Hearing none, we will... Uh, Take those, we'll take uh, 1003 first. That'll be short and sweet, and followed by the, uh, we'll hear from Fulton County Sheriff Labatt. All right, motion to approve by, uh, as the, to approve the agenda as amended by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Please vote. And the vote is open to approve as amended. And the motion passes unanimously. 23-0011, appointment of the vice chairman. All right. Entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to uh, appoint Commissioner Ellis as vice chair. All right, motion to appoint Commissioner Ellis as vice chair, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, let's vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, sir. Continue, Madam Clerk. On page six, 23-0012, ratification of minutes, regular meeting minutes, December 7th, recess meeting post agenda minutes, December 21st, 2022. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Please vote. And the vote is open. On the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 23-0013, presentation of proclamations and certificates. The first proclamation is recognizing Medical Examiner's Accreditation Appreciation Day sponsored by Commissioner Hall. Okay, now I'll ask uh, in the interest of time, although 
uh, in the interest of time, uh, if you can limit your acceptance speeches to two minutes, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Good morning. Come on in. All right. Well, Dick, Dick, you're the reason why we have this proclamation. So I'm expecting that you would be over here most definitely. When the county manager, well, behind the scenes, the county manager sent us an email telling us about this wonderful accreditation. And um, we have just watched our new medical examiner come in and just, she's, she's done an excellent job. And so when I was asked to sponsor this proclamation, I said, absolutely, I would. And so the proclamation reads, whereas accreditation by the National Association of Medical Examiners is an endorsement indicating that the office or system provides an adequate environment for a medical examiner in which to practice his or her profession and provides reasonable assurances that the office or system well serves its jurisdiction. And whereas the objective of the National Association of Medical Examiners is to ensure that the application of these standards will aid materially in developing and maintaining a high caliber of medical legal investigation of death for the communities and jurisdictions in which they operate. And whereas the name accreditation program is a peer review system whose goal is to improve office and system performance through objective evaluation and constructive criticism. And whereas achieving name accreditation benefits the entire community served by providing citizens and visitors with high caliber forensic and medical legal death investigations. And whereas the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office attained full accreditation according to the accredited standards of the National Association of Medical Examiners on December 14th, 2022, effective through January 4th, 2026. Now, therefore, yes, that is, that is very worthy of, yes, applause. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners recognizes the Fulton County Medi Medical Examiner's Office for their commitment to excellence and their efforts to make full accreditation possible and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, January 4th, 2023 as Medical Examiner's Accreditation Appreciation Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Congratulations. <laughs> I'll just say a brief word now on Alton to uh, say thank y'all. Thank you. I'm really honored uh, to be here with you, to see this progress, to do what you've done um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Even when we visit, it's a challenge. You do it every day. But then to accomplish this on top of everything else is truly phenomenal in a, in a world where the intensity of your work is incredible. Your work is scrutinized. Uh, the challenges are immense in terms of recruiting, but just your quiet leadership, your team have done a phenomenal job. And also, I'm going to give you a chance, too, because you've helped shepherd this uh, along the way. So please come up. Good morning, and thank you, Dick. Um, well, I, I just want to make one comment. The, the, the accreditation is a, is a big deal for us, but uh, I don't want it to be lost that when we asked uh, Dr. Sullivan to become the medical examiner. It was uh, we were two weeks into COVID. Um, we had uh, we had lost our accreditation six months before. Um, we had some challenges in getting people to come work in a, in our office, and uh, and then she uh, she raised her hand, 
uh, and said, I'll do it, right? And she came in. Uh, we, we, we were able to recruit new doctors. We're now fully staffed for the first time in a decade. Um, and, 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 and she did this. She did this during COVID and at a time, quite frankly, where uh, violent crime had uh, produced uh, more volume in the medical examiner's office than we had probably seen in some time. So really thank you not only for the accreditation, but for everything that you've done to turn this into one of the finest facilities in the state, if not the country. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'd just like to say thank you to Commissioner Hall. Um, big thanks to Mr. Anderson and Mr. Adams for the support that they have given to our office through our challenges. I'd also like to recognize our Deputy Director, Ms. Marion Green, our um, Division Manager, Paul Desimore, and our Executive Assistant, Carlisha Bentley. Without these folks' um, help and hard work and the hard work of everybody who's still back at the office doing work, none of this would, would um, be um, possible. And I definitely appreciate all of you and um, will continue to do the good work for the county. Thank you. The last proclamation is recognizing Human Trafficking Awareness Month, sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Okay. Could I get the individuals from Wellspring? But while they're coming down, Chairman, if you will indulge me, any and all law enforcement that are able to join us, as well as the sheriff, would you please join us? Um, Human trafficking has been found to be in all 159 counties. Most of us don't know that. First Lady Marty Kemp, that's a passion of hers, Grace, as well as others, to stop human trafficking. It is an epidemic. Uh, I thank the sheriff and all the law enforcement here that teaches their staff to see the signs of human trafficking. Uh, these two individuals that are standing next to me are phenomenal uh, individuals, and I want to uh, say before I go into the proclamation that Fulton County has taken the lead with the state of Georgia in fighting human trafficking. Other organizations that are trying to actually stop human trafficking look at these two members for their leadership and guidance to help stop it. So today, it is with honor and pride that I give this proclamation on behalf, this is a full board proclamation, all of the commissioners as well as the chairman have signed on. Whereas human trafficking, whether in the form of forced labor, sex trafficking, or other offenses, is a horrible abuse of power and a profoundly immoral crime that threatens the safety, health, and dignity of millions of people worldwide. And whereas during Human Trafficking Awareness Month, Fulton County reaffirms our commitment to protect and empower survivors of all forms of human trafficking to counter injustice and fortify our commitment to pursue dignity and freedom for all people. And whereas Fulton County efforts to fight human trafficking are exemplified by the work of numerous county agencies and their employees that are assisting survivors and their families, and whereas the Board of Supervisors recognizes and appreciates the outstanding work of the region's dedicated not-for-profit organizations that serve survivors and their communities. And whereas Wellspring Living has launched their Welcome Home campaign and has been at the forefront of this work for the last two decades and provides wraparound services, exceptional standards of care, and trauma-informed therapeutic interventions specifically designed for trafficking survivors. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners joins with all Fulton County citizens to support survivors of human trafficking and does hereby proclaim January 2023 as Human Trafficking <clears throat> Awareness Month in Fulton County, Georgia. Please come forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. You have been such a great support as well as all of the commissioners. It's true, Fulton County is a big deal because Fulton County has taken the lead to support the efforts to build capacity in Fulton County for more survivors to receive care. And the beauty is that the belief in the individual dignity, the belief in the need for mental health services, you are doing the things that will change the trajectory of so many lives. Lives like girls who are 12, 13 years old that are tricked into this terrible crime, this terrible situation. Women who never received an intervention and have been not given access to care are able to see lives, their lives transformed and their children. Christian Murphy and I are here to just say thank you. We are so grateful for your support. And we want to invite you, January 24th is going to be a big day for the medical examiners and also for Wellspring Living in Fulton County. We're sponsoring an event, an awareness event at the Central Library from 5 to 7 on January 24th. We invite all of you to join us. And just remember, there is no limit to what can happen for a person's life when we together as a community come and work together so that we can see our community transformed by compassionate care. So thank you, Chairman Pitts, and all of you for the work that you've done. We are so greatly appreciative of it. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, continue. On page six, public hearings, 23-0014, public comment. Citizens wishing to participate in public comment will be allowed to appear in person or may choose to participate virtually via Zoom video conferencing or by submitting their comments in writing online by registering on the county website at www.fultoncountyga.gov. Priority to public comment will be given to Fulton County citizens and those individuals representing businesses or organizations located within Fulton County. Speakers will be granted up to two minutes each. The public will not be allowed to yield or donate time to other speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting will not exceed 30 minutes. In the event the 30 minute time limit is reached prior to public comments being completed, public comment will be suspended and the business portion of the BOC meeting will commence. Public comment will resume at the end of the meeting. Ms. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we will start with the speakers here in Assembly Hall. We have received 12 speaker cards. 12. 12. Will the first six speakers please come down? Malik Hakeem, Jason Frazier, Lucia Frazier, Charmaine Minifield, Donna Watts Nunn, and Robbie Wyndham. All right, speakers, when you have uh, 15 seconds left of your two minutes, I'll simply say 15 seconds, and that's your uh, clue to begin to conclude your remarks. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Happy New Year. Congratulations again to Commissioner Thorne and Commissioner Barrett. My name is Malik Hakeem. I'm with Sadie G. Mays Health and Rehabilitation Center. We are a 206-bed skilled nursing facility here in the, in the county of Fulton. 
we provide services such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy for those indigent uh, residents in, this, in the county that need care. We have uh, been in business for about 75 years. It's a nonprofit organization uh, started by Sadie G. Mays. We have been partnered with Fulton County since 1968. We have been fortunate enough to receive a grant from Fulton County, and that grant has helped us over the years provide different services for the residents of the county. That grant has not been increased in several years. We are here advocating for an increase in that grant. We provide services on a daily basis that have been, um, we are in a, in a deficit on, on the daily basis of the funds that we need, and we are uh, approximately $1.2 million shortfall in what we get currently right now for the services that we provide. Our primary source of funding is through Medicaid. With Medicaid, it only provides certain services, but allowing us to have additional funds for the grant will allow us to provide other services for those who cannot afford it themselves. Again, we are Sadie Mays, a organization, nonprofit organization in Fulton County, providing services for residents of the county, employing residents of the county. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Frazier from Roswell. Last time I was down here, I detailed uh, 17,000 voter challenges that I had submitted so far. Uh, that number has grown to 25,000. Um, and today, I would like to talk a little more in detail on some of these uh, findings that I had found. The largest category of those are people that are registered more than once. And today, I would like to show you five people that were registered twice, each of them. So that's five people, same first name, last name, date of birth, and residents. Each of them were registered twice, so that's 10 unique voter IDs. In the same election, each of these people were given credit for voting. So that's five people, 10 registrations, 10 votes in the same election. I turned these people in as I suspected they were the same person. The elections department confirmed they were the same people and they merged them, so they admit they are the same people. Where Fulton County failed is they didn't look into why they had overlap in voting history. You can easily see this just by looking at the voter history file and looking up their voter IDs. It shows that they each voted in the same election. You have all taken an oath. It is against the law to vote in the same election twice. Now, I can't tell you if these people voted once, twice, or didn't vote at all, but somebody voted their IDs for them, or they voted themselves. I don't know. It takes an investigation to figure that out. Again, I've got five here. I'd like to, I've got a copy for each of you. Um, and if anybody here cares about election integrity and you want to actually dive into these five, I have more. If you want five more, I can give you five more. If you want 10 more, I can give you 10 more. If you want 100, if you want 1,000, there are plenty of these. I've turned in 20,000 duplicate registrations to Fulton County, and most of those have been merged, but not all of them yet, as I just gave them 7,000 a couple of weeks ago. There are plenty on the rolls. They're adding more every day. 15 seconds. Problem. I'd hope somebody here believes in integrity, election integrity and will do something about this. Thank you. Good morning, Lucia Frazier, Roswell resident. Um, I just wanted to welcome the new commissioners. Um, and then I also wanted to address that you have a $1.3 billion budget this year. And as you spend that money, I would love for you to consider these principles. Take a snapshot of the current state of whatever program you're supporting and use metrics that actually matter so that you can compare it in the future state. And show us, do some sort of a you know, summary for the people to see how their money is being spent and if it's working. Fund programs that go after root cause, not just Band-Aids to pad the bleeding. And then please do not promote anything that reduces personal freedom. Thank you very much. Good morning and happy new year, everyone. My name is Charmaine Minifield. I'm a visual artist. I'm the founder of the Praise House Project. Um, we place the Praise House, a site-specific public art installation, in spaces that have erasure of black history. Our first Praise House was placed at Oakland Cemetery and honored the 879 unmarked graves there. Our next Praise House is funded through a grant through the, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, Our Town Grant and we'll sit at Southview Cemetery. 
um, in the South Atlanta community to honor the victims of the 1906 race massacre and to lift up the, uh, the rich history of South Atlanta. We are grateful for the support of Fulton County uh, through uh, matching funds. Our partners include the city of Atlanta, DeKalb County, and Fulton County as our municipal partners. Um, we're here today to advocate for the arts and community, uh, to uplift history and narratives, as well as cultural identity in those communities, uh, to sustain communities by creating opportunities for the creative entrepreneurs of those communities, um, the network that exists in the ecosystem of the arts in, in, in our metro area has maintained our visibility worldwide in this county. One of our main exports is art um, out of this area, out of this region, and it is one of our main employers. Um, many of our commissioners have arts backgrounds, I've heard, and I want to celebrate the investment that Fulton County has made in the arts and encourage an increase in that investment um, as much as we possibly can. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everyone. Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm Donna Watson and I'm the new managing director at the Hammond Sass Museum. As a new managing director, I am thrilled to say that after we surpassed the challenges of 2022, um, we had to make decisions as to how to reopen when to reopen, what our hours would be, whether or not we would have mask mandates, to mask or not to mask, timed admissions. We really had to redo our operations. Once we got through that, we really had a pretty good season. And we were able to produce three exhibitions which showcased 10 artists, um, and each exhibition was eight to 10 weeks long. We hosted more than 99 public programs for the um, uh, residents of Fulton County. Uh, we welcome more than 5,500 patrons through our doors and hire three part-time teammates to increase our capacity so we can go ahead and add more services to the community. I've worked at the Hammonds House for seven and a half years. And what I know for sure is that we would have had an entirely different post-COVID recovery experience had we not been a part of the legacy program. So I thank you. I thank you and I thank you. I want to applaud you. So very much for coming to a meeting of the minds and creating that program and for letting us participate in it. It has allowed us to breathe during 2022 as opposed to holding our breath. We are now able to plan and get ready for this year because we are 35 years old this year and we will be celebrating our 35th anniversary of which you will be getting plenty of invitations. So we're putting your chief of staffs on notice. But I wanted to say thank you again and to say that we are working very hard to increase our reach into the community and we're striving to be excellent as always and of course, we appreciate your support, continued support, and just have a good day. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ravi Windham, and I am the education, education and uh, programs consultant at Hammond's House Museum. It is my honor to stand before you this in this new year and a day after my 40th birthday to speak to the wonderful effects of funding um, that we've received from Fulton County. With your generous support and funding, we have been able to create, provide, and sustain programs related to the history of the Hammonds House Museum, our permanent collection, which is very important, as well as uh, many programs that we have been able to do with our exhibitions that we have. Um, we've been able to pre present wonderful programs and educational tours as well with the Hammonds House Museum, and we've, we've been able to provide this for all ages, races and creeds. Just a few weeks ago, at our closing of our artist Tracy Morell's exhibition, which I saw some of you at, thank you so much for attending, um, I watched two complete strangers interact with each other. It was an energetic five-year-old, and she was speaking to a, a soon-to-be actual grandmother, and they instantly became BFFs just sitting there coloring with each other in our historic permanent collection green room. And after just kind of watching that interaction, I knew that was validation of the, the work that we are doing and constantly uh, creating uh, within Hammond's House Museum. So with that, um, we invite you, as Donna said, to uh, definitely come and celebrate our 35th anniversary, and we hope that seconds. you 
continue to, uh, we, we appreciate your continued support with the Hammond's House Museum. Thank you. Next six speakers, please come down. A.R. Cooper, Dr. Alan Holliday, Patrice Elzey, Michelle Taylor Willis, Robert Thompson, and Lydia Kimbrough. How you doing? Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Alan Holliday. Uh, I have a company called Magnanimous Worldwide. Uh, we provide uh, workforce development, music entertainment, but also mentoring. Um, today, you were able to hear uh, Jayla Singh. Uh, she's one of my artists that I brought here. I brought her to a couple of events here for Fulton County. I'm also a resident here in Fulton County, very proud of it. Uh, I want to step up here and just say thank you so much for your continued support in the arts. It's, it's been huge. Uh, we definitely need you to continue to, to push and put money into the arts. Uh, one of the things that I, I focus primarily on is uh, my passion is the youth, uh, young, at-risk African-American males. So uh, one of the things I love is that they love music. And one of the things we, we utilize is um, the arts. So primarily not just being in front of the mic, but sometimes it's behind the mic. The engineering, um, the directing, uh, just getting an opportunity to be exposed to different people like yourselves, commissioners who've made it and done well with themselves is important. So I just ask that you continue to do it, pour money into the arts. Atlanta's the hub, Fulton County's the hub right now. Um, it's done phenomenal things, so we just continue uh, to ask for more support there. Thank you. Good morning. Today was a good day to be at Fulton County. <laughs> I am Leatris Elsey. I'm a resident of South Fulton and a senior director of programming at the Apollo Theater. Prior to that, I was the executive director of Hammond's House Museum, and before that, I was this um, National Black Arts Festival's artistic director. I began my arts career in what seems like a lifetime ago at the Woodruff Arts Center. So I'm sharing all of that with you because I need you to understand that I don't take arts and culture nor its impact lightly. I'm clear about the transformative power of the work I'm engaged in and why its existence is necessary. It is ministry, meditation, and purpose. I'm glad that Fulton County doesn't take the arts lightly either. You have been the largest funder of arts and culture in our state for over four decades, and certainly the most significant funder for the Hammond's House Museum and the National Black Arts Festival in the history of both of these organizations who turned 35 this year. My voice is but one of many who will thank you for your ongoing commitment to these legacy institutions that were gaveled by this body and started in 1988 in partnership with Fulton County. In a recent conversation with writer and MacArthur Award um, fellow, ta Coates, he said something that was profound in its simplicity. He said that black-led institutions always have to punch above their weight. Because of the legacy of systemic discrimination, black colleges, universities, hospitals, and cultural organizations have been under-resourced since their inception and forced to do more with less. However, um, we do appreciate the additional funding that you have allocated for Hammond's House Museum. It was game-changing. It enabled the organization the space to develop a capacity building plan which moved the needle that much closer to its goals and objectives because sometimes it is the little things that are profound in their simplicity. It's the extra funding that expands capacity and makes space for the work. 15 seconds. I ask that you continue funding Hammond South Museum and National Black Arts Festival at the current levels because both organizations have served the Fulton County community well and have been a gateway to the world on your behalf. Thank you for your service and thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Michelle Taylor Willis. This is Sheila Mance. And uh, we're representing the, all of North Fulton, all of Fulton County, but really the arts community in South Fulton County. And I just am here to ask for money, basically. What we know is that, first of all, let me champion the efforts of Commissioner Rockman, Commissioner Hall, and Commissioner Arrington, who have been very, it's funny, I'm in front of cameras all the time and I'm nervous talking to you, I don't know why that is. Uh, <laughs> but we know that it takes an intentional effort in the arts to be a prestigious community. If you take the, the Bellevues of the world, the Portlands, the New York cities, all of them have a very intentional focus on the arts. And in South Fulton, we haven't traditionally had that. Thanks to David Manuel, who in a short tenure has done a really great job of putting, putting Fulton County as the center of that. Um, but in order for us to continue that trajectory, we 
need more money, specifically dedicated to the kids, the citizens, the residents of South Fulton County, which as you know, I like to call SOFU. Um, I think we're excited about 2023, um, and I think that we're excited about the transition that has been made. We can see the difference. I can see the difference. As an owner of a media company, arts is my thing, and I know that we did not have that focus five years ago. And we have it now, but the only way we can make sure that we champion our children and we set them up for prestige in 20 years is if we get them the funding they need so that we can have arts programs, we can have arts communities, and we can truly be the heart of art. Fulton County in Atlanta right now is deemed the heart, but we can't continue that without South Fulton County. And South Fulton County really 15 is- 15 seconds. Where it is at. So if you would please give us some of that budget so that we can take care of the kids. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my name is Robert Thompson. I am a citizen of Fulton County and a small businessman. Um, I want to talk about the intersection of arts and culture and business. Um, my company would not be possible without the support of the Hammonds House Museum and the funding that you give them. Uh, two, uh, in, 19, in 2017, we received a grant uh, from the Beltline Partnership, and the uh, Hammonds House Museum was the fifth fiscal sponsor, and they helped launch my company. And now um, it, it helped us go through the pandemic. Uh, as you know, the, the hospitality and tourism business took a, a severe hit. But because we had the Hammonds House to lean on, we were able to survive and will be part of the resurgence of the um, hospitality and tourism business in, in Atlanta. I also uh, am a member of the community, and we, um, uh, um, uh, excuse me, um, believe in a, in, a, in a process called asset-based community development. And the West End uh, part of Atlanta is very rich in cultural um, sites, the Hammonds House, um, West um, Performing Arts Center, the libraries. And they bring in tourism and tourism dollars to a community that's in desperate need of those um, dollars. And now that with the help of the um, facilities that are already there, they help the, um, the business stay afloat and we hope that you will continue that funding so that these businesses, seconds. Uh, tourism is a business and the support that the county gives it helps those businesses um, contribute to the economic development of the community. Thank you for your support. Hello, I'm Lydia Kimbrough. Um, I would like to welcome the commissioners. Um, as a new staff member at the Hammonds House, I want to thank you for supporting um, the museum. Um, after I returned to Atlanta during COVID due to the closure of my own gallery, um, the Hammonds House was there to support me and gave me a chance to restart my career. Um, the funding that you provide for the Hammonds House and all ag art agencies um, is critical to making Metro Atlanta a place of of people and fun and people my age can create a future with that. So I would like to thank you very, very much for your support and we hope to see you at some of our events. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have eight speakers on Zoom and three emailed in comments. Good morning, commissioners. The first person to speak is Ben Howard. Greetings, one and all. Ben Howard, Senior Advocate, Public Policy Analyst. Thank you for causing the involvement of the County Auditor and the County Attorney in the matter of Council on Aging Representation on the Commission on Elder Affairs. Their involvement helps to keep the situation in-house. As some of you may have diagnosed by now, the quote elephant in the room unquote is how to keep senior advocate ben howard from becoming a member of the fulton county commission on elder affairs 
During the course of this year, I will cause to be amassed via open records requests and other media, a compilation of documents that before the Commission on Elder Affairs takes another vacation in December, it would not take a rocket scientist nor a Perry Mason to see clearly what is now only opaque, the episodic barriers which have been preventing Ben Howard's full enjoyment of civic engagement rights guaranteed to citizens of his age group by denying him membership on the Commission on Elder Affairs. Stay tuned. The next person to speak is Susan Ross. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Susan Ross. I'm a resident of Fulton County and a, a resident uh, 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 in the Mighty Sixth District. Uh, I am I'm speaking on behalf of uh, your, to, to thank you for your support of the arts over the last 40 years. I, I think that Fulton County has been a tremendous benefit to the entire state and metro area. Uh, would particularly like to thank you for the leadership of uh, David Manuel with the Fulton County Arts Commission and for your establishment of the legacy programs for Hammond's House and uh, National Black Arts Festival, uh, both of which are institutions created in a public-private partnership with the county and which continue to serve the county today. Uh, in particular, I'm advocating on behalf of Hammond's House to thank you for, for the, the plan which has enabled us to develop into a full service institution again. Uh, and thank uh, congratulations to the commissioners who were re, uh, re uh, inaugurated today. And thank you all for your service. The next person to speak is Masood Alifani. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to, uh, my name is Masood Olafani. Uh, I am a uh, multidisciplinary artist based here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, really happy to have the opportunity to celebrate the work um, that the um, that Fulton County has done in supporting uh, the art, uh, the continued ongoing investment in places like Hammond's House, which is so critical, uh, has been invaluable. I remember the student at Morehouse College um, back in the 90s. When I, would, I was an art student and having the opportunity to go to Hammond's house and view the incredible artwork on the wall was the ongoing a source of inspiration for me. And um, I just want to acknowledge and celebrate the, the commitment that you've made to that institution um, to maintain it as a critical part of the arts ecosystem and, uh, and just to celebrate that and to, um, to encourage you to continue to support the institution uh, because as it stands, it's the only institution in the city of Atlanta that focuses on the visual arts contribution of the African diaspora. And we need to keep that going. Uh, it's one of the premier institutions across the state and indeed in the country. And uh, I look forward to the ongoing support and the programs that will come out as a result. So thank you so much. Uh, congratulations uh, to all of you and uh, Happy New Year. Thank you. The next person to speak is W. Imara Kennedy. Good morning, Commissioners. It is so good to be with you again, and particularly as this new year, as we come together to celebrate the phenomenal contributions of Fulton County from every corner and corridor of the county around art and culture. Um, I serve as the chair of the Hammonds House Museum, as well as um, serve on the boards of many other arts and cultural organizations all across the county. And I just simply come to say thank you for all that you've done and what we know you will continue to do. As you know, when you fund art and culture, you also fund economic development all across the county. You help to create thriving communities all across the county. You enhance the quality of life all across the county, and you help to support an entity that addresses issues around mental health, youth violence, and crime. So it's not just about an opportunity to bring people together for entertainment, but you really touch on so many critical issues that I know that you are charged to deal with each and every day. And so we in the arts community, whether we are business supporters that support the arts, individuals that support the arts, 
artists that have made a commitment to do their craft in Fulton County or arts organizations, we say thank you. And specifically on behalf of the Hammond South Museum, the National Black Arts Festival, and I would also say the John Creek Art Center, which are all now legacy organizations, we want to say thank you for creating that legacy program. Commissioners Baird and Thorne, we welcome you to the Fulton County family. And as art supporters and business owners and artists, we welcome your support as you join this family and this community that is thriving from every corridor because of the support of Fulton County for the arts. Thank you, happy new year, and we look forward to seeing you and supporting you soon. Have a blessed day. The next person to speak is Radhika Tupule. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you for your time. And first, congratulations on the ME certification. It is huge and I congratulate you, you all again for the tremendous effort that went into it. Uh, today, I'm here to request that Fulton County Animal Shelters contracted to Lifeline that that the Fulton County look into it, that they are operated efficiently and openly and ensure that the public funds are used appropriately. My specific asks are uh, three. Uh, one, the first one being an independent audit of Fulton County Animal Shelters and have an independent audit and release the audit's findings within 60 days. The second is um, the FCAS uh, have live stream cameras installed other shelters provide this to the public, and it should be pretty easy for Fulton County Animal Shelter to have a public cam, uh, to have a live stream camera installed within their shelters too. And third is review of Fulton County Animal Control contract and include penalty for non-performance and publish quarterly list. From what I am told, that uh, there is nothing, um, there's no audits of animal control being performed. Uh, at any given time. Uh, there's no uh, record of what's happening and there is nothing to trace uh, how, this, uh, this, uh, how the shelters are operated. Uh, so if an audit is performed and included and the recommendations are for penalty for non-performance and the list is published, the shelters will operate in an efficient manner, uh, making wise use of taxpayers' money. Uh, my last request is to uh, make the shelter operations uh, open. Uh, the currently animal shelter operations are shrouded in secrecy. I've fostered several times from the lifeline and whenever I've requested that uh, to give me the rescue group that they have been taken to, I have never been given any information, nor have I been given any lead. Thank you. The next person to speak is Robbie Caban. Greetings, I'm calling about Fulton County Animal Services as well. Not only the um, shelter, but the actual operation. As you know, in the December 7th meeting, Fulton County Commissioners referenced uh, six whistleblower statements. You were all advised by the CEO of Lifeline, our vendor, contractual vendor for animal control, that those whistleblower statements were old. That is simply erroneous and false. Four of those whistleblower statements are from 2022. One person still works at the facility. Two were wrongfully terminated for coming forward with dangerous conditions. One uh, worked there for three years. The other two, which if, if any of you had done a, the least amount of due diligence, we would have been happy to have this communication. We are sickened, literally sickened, at what is happening not only in our facility, but in the actual animal control operation, the field services. And you are all aware of it, all of you. All of you are aware of it. We went from 3.6 million to one to another million to a vendor that is Lifeline that has never had an audit. Lifeline is claiming no kill marketing. They are not operating a no kill model. They are using programs, HAS, that other shelters have removed due to the same horrific conditions that are happening to our animals and communities in Fulton County. We need an independent audit. Our animals are dying on the sides of the roads. They are dying in our shelter. They are being mauled. This has all been documented in other shelters. You have seen unsanitary conditions over and over and over and retaliation. And now our shelter isn't picking up animals and has influenza as a result of the horrific 
unsanitary conditions that you are all allowing. Our employees are under the gun. You all are aware. Please, we need an independent audit and a reform task force now. The last to speak is Lydia Meredith. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Happy New Year, commissioners, and thank you. To clarify, first of all, my greeting to Commissioner Hall is not intended to implicate her office as responsible for the issues presented to this board. I greet Commissioner Hall out of respect for her leadership in the district where I live, and because her office is always responsive and has done outstanding work for the citizens of this county. Adding the 13% ceiling to the agenda on Wednesday, January 18th is being led by Commissioner Hall, even though this is a district, county-wide, and statewide issue. The issues I bring to the Board of Commissioners are issues that affect every district. Commissioner Hall stands out as a beacon of hope for poor children, youth, and families residing in all districts. Her leadership continues to go beyond the call of duty on this matter and other matters affecting Fulton County citizens. It grieves me that after decades, this issue is still a countywide and district statewide problem. I advocate for every poor child in the county and state and the DFAC staff tasked to serve these poor children. I have appeared before the county board several times requesting an increase in the 13% ceiling so that we can more adequately and fairly compensate DFAC staff overseeing these children. I implore you to imagine what it's like for these children to live in poverty and then imagine their plight being left in the care of overwhelmed, overworked and underpaid DFAC staff workers without even a thank you or acknowledgement from this board, especially since the local news televised coverage of the DFAC staff walkout. 15 seconds. Several local news stories have been forwarded to the board, so this matter becomes an agenda item recognized as urgent and child safety, as we know, is and to protect the atmosphere where they are safe is an urgent matter. Inaction and delayed action is uh, it will cause harm and death. Thank you so much for your consideration. Happy New Year. And that is the last of the Zoom public comments. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, the three emailed in comments were also Zoom speakers, so no further speakers. Okay, thank you. Now, commissioners, I will be uh, polling you to, for us to make a decision on how we're going to continue to uh, receive comments from the public, whether in-house, Zoom, and the emails. So I've gotten comments back from you that we need to revise that. So I'll be talking with you to get a consensus on how we should continue to hear from the public. Continue, Madam Clerk. On page eight, the items that were moved up at the beginning of the meeting, commissioner's item 22-1003, discussion, magistrate court clerk and staff position sponsored by Chairman Pitts. Thank you. Just a quick update on that. I, had, uh, I said that I would meet with uh, uh, Magistrate Judge Clerk, uh, Kirk and uh, Ms. Tina Robinson, which I did uh, in my office. And I'm not sure we're making any progress, but uh, we've done some research. And I, along with uh, Alton Adams, Mr. Alton Adams and the county attorney, met with them. Uh, the county attorney is going to have a subsequent meeting with the two of them to try to come to some agreement. But I've been doing some research myself, and what it appears to me, what is working nationally and even right here uh, in the metropolitan area, in a classic example would be uh, how they handle that situation in Gwinnett County is a some consolidated effort. So Let's ask you, Mr. Adams, would you so, sort of summarize quickly uh, what our next steps are? Because it's my intent to have legislation before us regarding this matter at our January 18th meeting. Mr. Adams. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, County Attorney uh, Sue Jo can, can weigh in because she was there at the meeting as well. Um, in terms of next steps, I, I think there are three next steps. Uh, one is uh, specifically as it pertains to the uh, existing open positions in the magistrate court. They have uh, six or seven uh, open positions that have been funded by ORCA that have not been filled. 
that uh, we believe can help uh, uh, fill some of the gap in terms of, of support that Judge Kirk had asked for. Um, I don't think she was aware at the time that those positions had been extended to September of 2024, therefore taking some of the pressure off of, of uh, her being able to recruit and keep those resources. So that's the first thing that we can do immediately that doesn't require any additional action or funding. Uh, the second thing that, uh, that you requested is that um, uh, the county attorney and I uh, take a, a, a look at the Gwinnett model where there in fact has been a very successful consolidation of the uh, administrative functions and so on that appear to be working very well and come back to you with an analysis and to come back to you and the board with a recommendation analysis of how that could potentially work and what would be needed if you wanted to do some or all of that here at, um, at, at, at Fulton County. And then the third thing was that uh, as a result of that meeting, Judge Kirk provided uh, a few days ago a very detailed list of the uh, resources that she required. Some of those are a bit redundant with resources we already have and provide, but uh, we haven't had an opportunity to look in detail and be able to say how we might meet that need. So um, I think in, in terms of summary, the next steps are uh, from, from me and the, and the county attorney to work on specifically what the Gwinnett model might look like at, or, or something like that's a consolidated model. And as you know, uh, that's something that's been recommended over the last uh, few years by a number of, of organizations that we've had that came in and looked at our justice system. And then secondly, to work very quickly to make sure that we help Judge Kurt get the resources that have already been funded and approved as part of the uh, ORCA program. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, Madam County Attorney, do you want to add anything? Yes, Chairman Pitts, I just wanted to add that uh, Clerk Robinson and Chief Judge Kirk and I anticipate meeting next week and hope to um, identify some uh, facts that will assist uh, Mr. Adams in, in his efforts and we'll report back to the board. Okay, I'd like to have some legislation ready for our January 18th meeting. Our Commissioner Abdul Rahman and followed by Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, is the Gwinnett model considered the national model, Alton? Is that, I, was, I just wanna be clear, when you mentioned the Gwinnett, are they following the national model that most of the uh, similarly suited are doing? Is that? Uh, Commissioner, that's, that's, that's the trend in terms of where uh, organizations are moving. It's also very consistent with recommendations that we've had from uh, Accenture and others who have come in and looked at our system. Uh, that, that our resources, for example, IT and HR and some of those others are just spread across the system so that none of, none of our court systems have the critical mass really to be able to provide the support that, that we should have. And so to, to your question, Gwinnett appears to have taken a big step in embracing that model. There are others around the country, but if you said what, what's the trend now in terms of large um, uh, forward-looking uh, counties that have a similar scale that we do, they are all, in fact, looking at consolidation rather than dispersing the resources. Okay. Um, Chairman, um, I want to applaud your leadership in this, in trying to get this resolved. I just want to go on record, saying I have had a conversation with both individuals. Um, I will ask both ish individuals to work in a spirit of uh, uh, cooperating to get this resolved. I understand this has been an ongoing issue. Um, I am, I would be remiss if I didn't say I was upset about how this came to be. But I know at the end of the day, sausage tastes good. We don't like the way that sausage is made and what it looks like, but at the end of the day, it's very tasty. Uh, I have a distaste for what happened, but I applaud the leadership here with Alton, the county manager's office, and the chairman. And I look forward to a resolve because in both of you all's capacity, you all are revered in the community. You both are. And I think this is something, maybe the lack of communication, I'm not sure what happened because I wasn't there. But moving forward, please always come to the elected officials and let us know what's going on. We're here to serve and help and make sure that the Fulton County citizens are the ones that don't end up being the casualty, but that we're using their tax dollars prudently 
to make sure they're getting every bit of it. So thank you, Chairman, for your leadership on this. Uh, Commissioner Arrington. So uh, as, as an attorney, I actually use both of these offices um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, I think that we, you know, we got where we are because we, because of consolidation. That, that's what got us where we are right now. So I, I think both of these individuals are in charge of their own shops and they should be empowered to do whatever they need to do in their own shop and they will be held accountable by the residents of Fulton County. Um, I think consolidation would be good, but I think we've seen uh, an eight-year track record that these two people are not able to work well together. And so they need to be empowered to run their own shops, and we need to move forward and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I, I, I don't understand how... I don't understand the talk of consolidation in this Gwinnett model, so I'd love to hear more about it because we already got consolidation. That's what led us to where we are now, because we consolidated. Um, and so I, I, I have no faith that more consolidation between these two offices and these two people will, will be productive or efficient. And so I think they need to have a clean cut and each go their way. They, you go over there, one is in, you walk in on the on first floor, the Superior Court Clerk's Office is right there. You go down stairs to TG100, and that's the Magistrate Court. It's, they're already divided. We, they, they were originally divided. We put them together. It hasn't worked well. There's been backlog and they need to be separated as far as I'm concerned. Now, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to hearing what other options are available, but as far as those two people continue to work together, if anybody is proposing that, <laughs> they are not thinking wisely. Those two people have proven that they cannot work well together. Period. Commissioner Ellis. I just want to echo some of the concerns that Commissioner Arrington raised. Um, and I think if you're going to not knowing exactly kind of what the Gwinnett model is, I think the certainly that it would appear from based upon everywhere else we've looked at that a consolidation should work. Uh, but if whatever design we have can't work and it's not working because of why is it not working? Is it, are they, is it not working because of personality conflicts? Is it not working because there aren't inherent accountability, accountability measures built into the system for um, accountability back from the administrative functions to the, um, to the magistrate judge and the other judges? Um, so I think for us to move forward, like Commissioner Arrington suggested for me, um, in something that's consolidated, those two things have to be addressed, and both parties uh, need to demonstrate how they're going to how they're going to make this work. Um, I mean, I'm not really quite sure why it broke down in the first place, since this is what you know we were requested to do, uh, but nonetheless, it it occurred. So. I think as you present this, those to me, those two questions have to be answered, right? You know, what is the commitment of the two parties to the model? What are the accountability measures that are going to be in place to ensure that, you know, one party is accountable to the other and that the, the folks that are, quote unquote, you know, designated for those roles are actually doing the work? I mean, can we, can we look at it in terms of just specific job tasks, performance measures, whatever it is? Um, uh, that's that's the stuff that I've that I've got to understand in terms of you know moving forward with this. But I mean, 
in the end of the day, this to me does not seem, while there might be some element of, of resourcing here, this is less, seems to be less of a resourcing issue, and more of a structural issue. Um, and um, it just sort of needs to be put to rest. I mean, we can't continue to have, you know, parties, you know, engaging in litigation and mediation and that sort of stuff. That needs to kind of come to a close. So. Commissioner Barrett. I am probably going to ask this a few times during today's meeting as the newbie, but um, Mr. Adams, if you could maybe give a little background on this issue. Um, I'm sort of picking up what's going on from the conversation, but I, I'd love to really have a better understanding of what the problem is. I will. Um, well, how much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> um, if I can, though, it's a pretty complex, and, and so it's, it's hard to, I, I'm trying to, I'll try to break it down as, 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 as uh, simply as I can, but I, I'm happy to spend more time if, if, if you'd like giving you more background. Uh, the, 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 magistrate, the, the clerk function um, and administrative function from magistrate court was never in magistrate court in our county. It was part of our state court function. State court provided the support, the clerk support, administra administrative support, for magistrate court. Uh, six, seven years ago, Judge Kirk requested that it be moved to superior court. It was moved at that time, uh, at her request. She asked the clerk to take that on as part of the responsibility because she wanted an elected clerk to take on that responsibility. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, Judge Kirk has said she's changed her mind, right, her words, and would like to take that back, but it's never been in magistrate court, right? Like I said, it's never been there, so what it requires is the creation of a separate structure within magistrate court that we, you don't have a model for. Nobody seems to, if, if you look around the state, there is no superstructure in magistrate court that, that mirrors what you have in superior court or state court. So it's a, it's a new thing. And the funding and the process and everything else is not inconsequential. It's a couple million dollars a year ongoing if it actually works. And so um, the, the, the question about when, when, and, and, and when, when Commissioner Arrington says it was a result of consolidation. It really was moving it from state court to superior court, but it was never in magistrate court. So we're talking about setting up a standalone function in magistrate court, which I said is not necessarily a model that we see anywhere else, certainly in the state, if, if, if not the country. And, and not saying that we shouldn't have that, right? I'm not saying, it, but it has some implications. However, in terms of being able to have a, here again, critical mass support for the various functions, uh, the way we do it today, in terms of the way we are spread out in terms of these administrative functions, not necessarily clerk, but administrative functions, is inherently inefficient, and it doesn't allow us to provide the highest level of resource and support across the various functions in the court system. And that's what's been found over and over again. And so this is less about a structural issue. It's even less about a um, funding issue and it has more to do with the fact that, we, that, that our clerk and our magistrate court judge have differences of opinion about how things should be run. And that's as simply and as, probably as diplomatically as I could put it. All right. Now, we're not going to debate this today. Uh, we want, this is an update today, Judge Kirk. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so... My first question is, what model are they currently operating under? The current model is that the, uh, the clerk of Superior and Magistrate Court, um, uh, Tina Robinson, provides clerk services to Magistrate Court and to Superior Court. Okay. That's the model that we can, and then state, our state court has their own clerk, as does the um, as does juvenile court. And how is that different from the Gwinnett model? Because I'm well, not familiar with the Gwinnett model at all. Gwinnett has one clerk that provides support to all of those, to everything except juvenile court. And I think they're looking at. It. So they have one clerk that provides. So they have a chief, they have a a clerk of Superior State and Magistrate Court providing providing clerk services across across those various uh, those various courts. And I do believe, Commissioner Hall, that they also have a administrative function that provides support across those as well. Okay. So have both parties agreed to move toward 
the Gwinnett model since no, there was a meeting? No. No. The, oh. the, the, the follow-up no. meeting, as the county attorney said, a follow-up meeting is scheduled for next week with the mm -hmm. county attorney and the two of them in a, a private meeting. I won't even oh. be involved in it, just the two of them, to try to work something out. And if we can't work something out, I'll be bringing some options back, including a full uh, explanation of how this, how a consolidated function could, I would say, could work. Could work. Okay, but what happens if both parties decide that that's not what they want? It's going to come down to a, a vote of this board? That's correct. Okay. Like Speaker Pelosi, count to four. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, that answers all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I won't belabor the point, but I think out of sense of fairness, we do have two new commissioners. Commissioner, um, the commissioner did ask, how do we get here? And since we do have Judge Kirk here, I would ask an abbreviated, if we could, you know, if you could just give an abbreviation of what, what you are asking for, what's working, are not working so the new commissioners Commissioner. could be brought up to date? Uh, just, just a minute, D Judge Kirk, just a minute. Now, all due respect, Commissioner, I understand what you're saying, but in, uh, this is just an update mm -hmm. thing. And I would ask Judge Kirk that you take the time to meet with the two new commissioners to brief and that them was be from, my from, request. From, from your perspective. That was going to be my right, request because what you're minute, hearing is incorrect. Just, I want to put it on record. I just, want to just put it on Kirk, record, Chairman Pitts, just, that what you are Kirk, hearing from the individual that has not Kirk, been to my shop to figure Kirk, out what's going on does not Judge know. Kirk, we are please. operating under the Gwinnett model now, and I Judge apologize, Kirk, Chairman. But this is unfair. Judge Kirk, please. I would ask that you two uh, schedule time to meet with, uh, with Judge Kirk, and then at the same time, though, meet with uh, uh, Ms. Robinson, the clerk. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Abdul Rahman, sorry. That's, that's okay, Chairman. At the end of the day, I don't, I don't have a dog in this fight, but I just want, I want transparency. I want the n new commissioners to be afforded the opportunity to know what's going on. This is convoluted, I will say that. And you will not come to any understanding over a few minutes of having a conversation with the executive staff. And so that's why I wanted to make sure that those that uh, are stakeholders, which ultimately are the citizens of Fulton County, uh, that they know what's going on. Our new commissioners are brought up to speed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, next item. Mm -hmm. On page eight, under Justice and Safety, 23-0021, Sheriff, discussion, Fulton County Sheriff Labatt, fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. All right, here we go. Good morning. I promise you I will be a little more swift than I was the last three times, as well as I promise you, Mr. Chair, I won't be at the other 91 meetings uh, this year. Uh, however, I do want to start by saying a welcome to our new commissioners. Happy New Year to each of you, and really want to express uh, a debt of gratitude to each of you for the calls, the text, um, the emails concerning the loss of our Deputy Tom, Thomas, uh, tragic loss of Deputy Thomas. And to that end, I'll start with three quick stories, if I may, and it will lead into a question asked by Commissioner Ellis, and then I'll be continue to move pretty swiftly. Um, one, the question was asked about our tactical teams, our support teams, our teams that, uh, how many and et cetera on each team, what do they do, what does that look like, and, and how do we support that, and, and what does that mean as we get ready to move forward. Story number one, each of you have in your emails a horrific story of a young lady that threw uh, some chemical on a young lady in New York and then decided she was coming to South Fulton County to hide. 
It was my SWAT team and Scorpion unit that went in and held her accountable. A couple of weeks ago, our SWAT team, again, in conjunction with the FBI, went out and apprehended an individual that was wanted out of New York for posing as an FBI agent and as well going in and robbing people out of New York decided South Fulton was the place he wanted to hide, again, not working. And as recently as this weekend, while a lot of us were, were enjoying the new, the new year, we just recognized the young ladies for their human trafficking efforts. One of the things that we were very intentional about doing was adding to the force or creating that force multiplier for human trafficking. And just last week, we had a young lady that was 20 years old that was arrested by East Point. As it turns out, she was not 20, she was 15. She was being human trafficked and uh, we were able to get her back to her parents. And this is what the Fulton County Sheriff's Office and these specialized units continue to do. Uh, I'd be remiss with our new commissions not to uh, skim over the fact that we have, as the Sheriff's Office and me specifically, have three constitutional responsibilities. And they're not just responsibilities, they're duties. They're not niceties, they are duties. Number one being the chief law enforcement in Fulton County, period, full stop. And that includes all the resources and all of the wherewithal that goes with that. What I did afford each commissioner in that collaborative uh, space that, that we were discussing a few moments ago is each new commissioner got a hold or has the midterm or mid-year review that you all were privy to, the Oscar Award winning piece that the chairman referred to. Number two, running the jail, and number three, protecting the courts. The interesting piece here is what you all have been used to, minus our two new commissioners, for years is a sheriff's office that focused on the latter two and did not focus on being in our community as a whole. And those are the things that we have been able to do. So Commissioner Ellis asked specifically about the Scorpion unit, the Motors unit, uh, those specialized operations. And one of the things I wanted to do, uh, certainly being respectful, is be able to answer our public and give people an understanding of what we do. So our Scorpion unit, for instance, and each of you have this slide presentation. Again, it's shorter than normal, but you'll see right here under the Scorpion unit, there are 14 members that have affected 339 arrest warrants, 400 and 402 warrants, and 155 persons located, 75 guns seized. But in effect, they've also done jail operations. So what you'll see across the board, and I'll go back down to the Motors Unit now, with 188 uh, citations slash warnings, right? I don't believe everybody should get a uh, ticket just because, so we focus on warnings where they are applicable. And uh, those six individuals, that's how many people we have on our motor unit, have done a little over 3,000 hours of special details. Our K-9 unit, which is one of the best in the country, uh, actually services each of you every day, and you probably don't even know it. We sweep our, our government center every day that you prior to you coming in and then you see the details there. Now, what's important here is we're able to drop those units into the jail. So specifically, for instance, we have one gentleman sergeant on the motors unit who goes into the jail every Tuesday and Thursday and focuses on mental health. He along with each a person from each one of those specialized teams. But look, uh, if you will move on that first slide, if you look to jail operations, you'll look where our, on average our traffic team goes in and does uh, 10 shakedowns. These are things that we're not able to do without these units. So in and of, it, in and of themselves, you'll see the, the, not just the justification, but in being good partners, we wanted to make sure we had that conversation. Commissioner Ellis, I wanted to make sure you were uh, respectfully, you asked a question, we want to make sure you get the answers to it. Now, in the spirit of collaboration, which is uh, where we want to live, and, one of the, and taking into consideration some of the comments we had previously with respect to our salaries, with respect to triple time, with respect to 480 versus 240, and what that looks like. So again, 
and I, I will run the risk of repeating this for our, our new commissioners because when I said it the first time, some of our commissioners didn't even know we did this. So to our new commissioners and, and, and other commissioners have heard this ad nauseum, when we hire someone new, a deputy or a detention officer, we require them to volunteer and give 480 hours, almost half a year of service time before they can actually make overtime. It is absolutely unheard of. For civilians, or in our case, we call them professional staff, we require 240. So now in that spirit, one of the things that we want to talk about really quickly, if you look at the next page, is we talked about the salaries and, and, and really how do we become competitive. And the ask, and I wanted to make sure each of you had it as a reminder, the ask for detention officers was 63,000, 70,000 for deputy sheriffs, but we thought in terms of, and again, please, please know that part of our conversation was germane to what our county manager had to offer during the budget discussion. So this doesn't preempt anything, but these numbers in this conversation is based on our working together to try and figure out how we take monies that, whether it be the $7 million that Commissioner Hall uh, how outlined in terms of outsourcing, what that looks like, where it can be spent. And so part of that was how do we, instead of do a 40% increase how to, based on the com comments between Commissioner Ellis and, and Arrington, how do we get piece of this pie, continue to encourage our employees and continue to move forward. So that is the chart there with, for your consideration there. So at this point, the plan would be to have you have the facts in your hand as you continue to work with, or as the administration continues to do the work to figure out how we, how we get there. So the next page. The comp time, I mentioned the 480 and the 240 in lieu, of, uh, in lieu of payment. One of the things there is we've, working with Mr. Herman and his team, projection overtime there, projected overtime would be $5 million there. And then the last page in terms of triple overtime, a couple things that we actually learned as we took a step back with respect to that. Part of that, and that $15 million looks like a large number, but part of that's already baked in. If, and using the same methodology that Mr. Herman and his team use, if we're already paying and projected at $5.2 million in overtime, to achieve triple time, we would simply double that, right? Because we pay at time and a half. And then, of course, Mr. Herman and his team can correct any of the math as we get ready to move forward. But part of that is already baked in. So if you take the part that's baked in, there's an assumption, and, and, and I say assumption, the proposed budget, if you recall, reduced our budget from 129 $129 million to $124 million, and that was the vacancies there. The conversations we had with, I had specifically with our county manager would replace that, right? And then there's some opportunity baked into the budget, and he, will, he can certainly Again, this is kind of out of order, right? And I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to move this conversation along. But as he gets ready to go through his budget presentation, there's some additional funding that will help us. If we tweak this as, as you, you, the give and take piece, this is the give and take side over here uh, between Commissioner Ellis and, and, and Commissioner Arrington had that conversation just two weeks ago, we can actually accomplish four of the, th six things that we, we wanted at smaller rates, but then give people an opportunity, our, our staff an opportunity to, to feel appreciated, to come to work. Uh, I, again, you will see in your emails a couple, the story about New York, the, the wonderful team that uh, went in there and uh, extricated that young lady, et cetera. So we will continue in the spirit of collaboration to make sure we communicate and where we, if there's something else we need to do there, we wanna make sure that we do a good job there. And lastly, I'll leave you with this, with going back to the salaries and the 480, you'll see uh, on the chart that has the original ask of 63 and 70 on it, you will see right below the, the title, you'll see inactive sheriffs, 
Office of Key Classification Planning allowing adjustment of positions without impacting other county departments. If we can take into consideration and as the county manager proceeds to move forward with the budget, the money is there based on our soft calculations for us to accomplish those four items and it would set us apart from many of our counterparts across the country. So if there are any questions, I certainly will take those, but uh, as promised, short and sweet. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, any questions of the Sheriff at this point? All right, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, if I can yes, thank you and, and the commission. Uh, the memorial is here tomorrow for Deputy Thomas at 6.30, uh, should you all have time to attend. But again, we'll we appreciate here. it. Hold on, Chair. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Barrett has a question. Um, again, apologies because new person, but can you just, with these numbers you're presenting here, where does that line up with the proposed budget that we have in front of us for today? So again, because I have not seen okay. what uh, our county manager is going to present, I would be hopeful that uh, with these numbers and you all's direction, right, that we will get to at least beyond the 129, which is our original budget, taking these things into account somewhere around 143, 145. I will have to depend on our county manager and that presentation okay. to be able to to articulate that. Thank but you. But with you all's direction, I believe we can certainly get there. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Back on page seven, under open and responsible government, 230015 finance, review and approval of the fiscal year 2023 final adopted budget and budget resolution. Okay. And for the record here, uh, Commissioner, we all know this, but just to, to restate this, uh, we're required to, a, to approve a budget no later than the second meeting uh, in January, which means that we have until our next meeting on the 18th. And from my perspective, there's a lot that um, we need to talk about. So I don't anticipate us being able to approve a final budget here today. Uh, Mr. Manager. Yes, sir. I wanted to make just a couple of comments and then turn it over to Ms. Whitmore. Um, for the benefit of two new commissioners, but a reminder to everyone, uh, when the decision was made by the Board of Commissioners to reduce the millage rate from 9.33 to 8.87, we began the budget development process using more what I would term a rules-based approach. In other words, not considering all enhancements because there was over 250 million in enhancements from internal as well as external parties. And the going in view with that millage rate was about a $90 million gap. So it was a rules based, meaning we were going to do the things necessary to keep employees that are here today employed, uh, not keep programs that are underway today going, but no new programs, no expansions, no significant uh, increases. The Board of Commissioners uh, all along the way supported that approach um, to get to a balanced budget. So we are at a balanced budget uh, today. The second thing I'd like to say is as we closed out 2022, the good news is, is that we, underrun, we underran our expense projections. And you'll see that in the information that Hakeem just passed out. And again, we recognize that we got this to you late yesterday and apologize for that with the uh, closeout as well as the days removed for holidays, that became the, the necessity. So I do think there's another two weeks of discussion, uh, input from you on, how, on changes that need to be made and then a final presentation. Um, we also though, in, as a consequence of finishing better uh, in 2022, did propose today an unallocated reserve of 22.5 million. So what that means is that's monies that you could allocate in the budget. You wouldn't have to re-advertise once you make final decisions on if you kept those for later in the year or conversely, as you consider the final budget uh, for uh, approval, you could allocate part of that, all of that 22.5 million. Our thought was, kind of in the spirit of keeping our powder dry, there's at least four or five things maybe to, uh, as a call against that uh, reserve. One is just an uncertain economic outlook. I think everybody can identify that the recession is likely that will impact potentially our revenues. So that is one reason to, uh, 
to keep something additional in reserve. The second is what the sheriff brought up. There are ongoing issues uh, at the sheriff's department, some of which we have attempted to address, but the ones that he was discussing today have not been explicitly addressed in the budget that's before you. A third item is employee pay. We still struggle with uh, retention and I think will as long as inflation remains at the level that it's at. And as you recall, using the approach that we outlined um, early in the process, we do not have an employee performance payment in 2023 anticipated, and that's about $15 million. Last, um, we do have facility, facility construction cost pressures as we complete some of these major programs that are already uh, in the final stages, the warehouse, uh, the animal shelter, public safety training center, and I do anticipate that there will be some pressure there with today the inability to quantify what that is. And then lastly, there are always some items that are specific to a district or a commissioner that uh, you would want to add at this point in the process. So for all those reasons, this seemed like the best approach for us uh, to take. And then again, I would just remind you as you're thinking about this, there were $250 million in additional asks that were not included in this uh, presentation that you're about to see. So certainly, if you were to go far down that path, then you really need to think about the millage rate assumption that you would tell us to uh, include as part of this uh, budget development. Because, of course, now we're using the millage rate approved uh, in the uh, last session where the board considered the millage rate. So with that, I think Ms. Whitmore will give you the overview of this, answer any questions obviously today, take any uh, guidance, and then we anticipate more work to be done prior to the next board meeting. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, commissioners, uh, I will walk us through um, the update, the presentation that we have, um, which is really an update on our uh, actual 2022 results, as well as the um, recommendations for uh, modifications to the 2023 proposed budget. Next slide, please. Um, to the point that the county manager made in his opening remarks, we did end uh, 2022 um, with less in expenditures than we had originally projected. At mid-year, we had projected that we would um, end the year with about $832 million in expenditures. We actually ended um, at $786 million. That's a $46 million um, difference. On the revenue side, we had projected revenues of $764 million. Uh, we ended the year with $760 million. Um, that's a negative variance of $4 million. So the net difference between our mid-year projection and our um, end-of-year results is a $42 million increase to our end-of-year fund, fund balance, increasing it from $182 million um, at the mid-year projection to a final ending fund balance of $224 million which shows that we did pull um, about $26 million of our fund balance that we started the year with. <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, these next couple of slides are simply um, sharing with you the underlying uh, reasons for uh, these variances that you see. On the revenue side, the $4 million variance is, um, is driven really kind of by two different categories of, of items. One is where um, revenues just uh, didn't play out as we expected them to um, uh, from a, a projections perspective. So in some cases, we had higher revenues, in particular in courts and law enforcement, state grant revenue, um, motor vehicle commissions, real estate transfer tax. Um, but then we also had lower revenues in uh, the commission on taxes that the tax commissioner collects for other uh, municipalities, penalties and interest on tax collections, um, intangible taxes that are tied to real estate transactions, um, and then uh, some uh, other miscellaneous revenue sources. Um, one of the bigger adjustments that we had is in uh, the timing difference on uh, current year real property tax collections and current year public utility um, property tax collections. So in the real property tax category, uh, we had projected a 96% collection rate 
what was collected and remitted by the tax commissioner um, to the finance department by the end of the year was a little bit less than the 96 <clears throat> percent. So we, we, uh, we saw about a $5.6 million reduction from what we had projected at that 96 percent collection mark. Um, uh, with the public utility property taxes, we had projected uh, based on the, uh, the, the billing time frame and the expected due date on those, we had, we had projected um, slightly um, less in public utility taxes than what actually came in. So we, we collected about $3.6 million more than what we had projected. Um, and so both of those are timing differences and <clears throat> have an impact on the 2023 budget. So what we didn't collect in real property taxes in 2022, we carry forward and make an adjustment in into next year's um, prior year uh, real property tax um, revenue anticipation. Um, on the public utility side, we have to also make an adjustment because we had included um, a higher prior year number for public utility taxes and we'll have to reduce that amount. All of these adjustments together net down to um, a $4 million um, reduction from our projection in 2022 to our actual results, with the bottom two having a carry forward effect in 2023. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On the expenditure side, um, we did have a $46 million underrun. Uh, the majority of that coming from uh, vacancies that were not filled. Um, as part of the mid-year projection, uh, we projected that at the point in time, um, at the mid-year mark, we projected that we would fill 85% of the vacancies um, remaining through the end of the year. That did not occur, um, and as a result of that, we had um, uh, um, personnel salary savings that um, ended up dropping down uh, to fund balance. In addition to that, departments did not spend 100% of what they had been provided in their operational um, budgets. Most notably, uh, the elections department. They dropped a significant um, amount of what was budgeted for the election cycle in 2022 to fund balance, a portion of which we know we still have um, invoices on that we need to pay. So we will be, uh, you'll see in, a little bit later that we're recommending that we roll forward some of that so we have those resources to pay those invoices next year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, with the effect of uh, having now the actual numbers for 2022, we have gone through um, each of our appropriated budgets and we've made um, changes where necessary. So in the general fund, um, we have modified our proposed budget recommendation from $850 million to $879.9. And we'll review uh, the recommendations specifically in a later slide. Um, it, traveling on down um, the, uh, the list, the next fund that we have a change in is the county's risk fund. And that was a um, $100,000 adjustment. Um, and then in the special appropriation funds, these are um, a number of different special revenue funds um, that we uh, package together as the special appropriation funds and present them. So we uh, balance those out based on their um, actual activities in 2022 um, and then made modifications to what we expect, um, how we expect those same special revenue funds to perform in 2023. The result of that was a $2.7 million increase um, in the uh, appropriation for those funds. Um, uh, all combined, that increases our um, total budget from one point two billion to the one point three billion that the chairman mentioned in his um, remarks during the um, ceremony earlier today. Next slide, please. So the revisions <coughs> um, to the budget for 2023. On the revenue side, we are um, proposing a, a total reduction in revenue of seven point seven three million and we'll cover the, the reasons for that um, here in another slide. And then an increase to the expenditure budget of 29.87. That is primarily, um, uh, that increase on the expenditure side is, is primarily being supported by the additional fund balance that we carry forward um, from 2022. Uh, so 
um, at the end of the year with an $802 million revenue appropriation, an $880 million expenditure appropriation, and a beginning fund balance of $224 million, we would project to end the year with $147 million, um, which is the required 16.67% fund balance reserve. Next slide, please. Um, so why do we need to reduce our revenue um, appropriation by $7 million? Um, as we look at the 2022 actual um, revenue receipts and we see uh, those areas where um, we missed our projection um, and we do not believe that it's a timing difference, um, we've made a recommendation to um, adjust the 2023 revenue for that. Um, in this case, we have a uh, recommendation to um, decrease uh, commission on tax collections for other municipalities, penalties and interest on tax collections, current year intangible tax, and communications center revenue. For those items that are timing differences where we do um, believe that the, the revenue will come in, it was just a matter of it not coming in when we projected it would come in. Um, we have made a recommendation to modify um, our um, prior year real property tax collections in 2023 and increase that by 5.6 million. That's effectively the effect of the 1% that we did not collect in 2022 that we had expected to collect. Conversely, we need to decrease um, the appropriation for public prior year public utility property tax collections because that um, 3.6 million was actually collected in 2022. And so we need to reduce what we had um, uh, originally thought would be carried forward into 2023 as a prior year tax. So um, together, that all is a $7 million um, reduction in the revenue appropriation. Next slide, please. From an expenditure perspective, um, we have a recommendation to um, increase uh, the proposed budget by $29.8 million, um, and, and it's broken out into a couple of different categories, the first of which is carry forward expenses for obligations that were not paid in 2022. Um, the top item is, is for the Department of Registration and Elections. Um, they have provided us with um, the expected um, invoicing from several of their um, uh, providers that are related to the November and December election um, cycles that uh, they have not fully invoiced the county, so we expect those invoices uh, to come forward in the month of January, uh, and they asked for about $2.6 million to cover those. We also um, had an item that the board had acted on last year to provide funding to the Atlanta Technical College of $500,000, and the request to pay those resources out to the Technical College um, was not brought forward during 2022, so we wanted to make sure that we reappropriated those funds and had them available in 2023 um, to make that payment um, to the, the Technical College. Um, the second item are there were a couple of contracts that the board approved towards the end of the year that required some additional funding, um, notably in senior services. Um, one is the aging services contract that required an additional $896,000. Um, and the second is the uh, transportation um, contract with uh, TransDev, um, where we needed to ensure that we fully covered the, um, the cost of the fuel that the county will be paying directly. And that was an additional um, $400,000 over what was already contemplated in the budget for that. Next slide, please. <coughs> This next section, um, it's really a, uh, an adjustment and a transfer of resources between um, uh, departments within the existing budget did not result in any incremental change to the budget as a total, but we are recommending um, that we transfer the um, FGTV and Fulton Films um, uh, functions from uh, the Department of External Affairs to the Department of Arts and Culture and that's a, a $1.2 million adjustment um, in, both, in both ways, a reduction for external affairs and an increase for arts and culture. And the second item is uh, based off of the um, previous uh, board meeting and the sheriff's presentation and the discussion around um, restoring uh, the 
uh, attrition factor that was applied to the sheriff's budget, we did reduce his uh, budget in 2023 by the same 33% attrition factor that we applied to um, every department with vacancies. Um, that amount for the sheriff was 5.1 million. So we are proposing to restore that um, to the sheriff's budget and to reduce the funds that have been set aside for um, inmate outsourcing or um, the, the inmate housing contracts that we have with um, Cobb County and the Atlanta Detention Center. Um, most notably, um, what the recommendation would be is to reduce um, the funded beds at Cobb County from the contracted level of 500 down to what we have, um, I, I believe, seen in, in actual utilization of around 300 beds um, per month. And uh, we would move the funds, the $5.1 million, into the sheriff's budget and leave the remaining uh, funds in non-agency to support um, the uh, inmate housing with Cobb County and the Atlanta Detention Center. And then uh, this next item it is, um, these are uh, some ad additional um, items that came to our attention after we finalized and submitted the proposed budget um, and, and felt like they um, were items we definitely needed to make a provision for. Um, the first is uh, some um, incremental uh, professional services dollars for the information technology department so that they can um, uh, use some contracted staffing in some key areas where they still have have um, had high turnover and have not been able to um, uh, fill or refill positions quickly enough um, in an effort to ensure that we are able to to maintain the county's um, uh, infrastructure and IT operations um, at uh, an, a, an appropriate level while we continue the recruitment process and, and finish filling out um, all of the positions in the IT department. And then the second item is um, associated with the uh, uh, opening of the consolidated warehouse, um, which we expect um, to, to start um, housing operations um, towards the uh, the end of the first quarter. Um, we needed to make sure we covered the utilities uh, and that has been estimated about $1.4 million. Next slide, please. This next slide is uh, are all of the increases um, that were identified um, that are related to the commission district budgets themselves. Um, we've identified um, the amounts uh, per district, and uh, they are related to um, ensuring that we fund the um, uh, state's COLA that was approved last year, as well as cover any um, uh, final paychecks or um, uh, compensated absent payouts to um, uh, the staff of um, former commissioners, um, as well as ensuring that the incoming commissioners um, are able to um, fund and fill the uh, number of positions that they are allowed um, per current board resolution. Um, so the amounts vary by commissioner um, based on uh, the, um, uh, the needs for each office. Next slide, please. That totaled about $323,000. And then lastly, um, the manager um, did cover this in his, his open, opening remarks. Um, we have set aside $22.2 million in an appropriated reserve in non-agency um, to be used to address, uh, you know, the things that we, we just don't know. Certainly, um, we don't know what's going to happen from an economics um, perspective. Um, we, may, we may need these resources. Um, for something that we couldn't fathom during the budget process. Um, he also, I think, uh, spoke about the employee compensation, perhaps restoring pay for, pay for performance or providing uh, the sheriff additional resources, and then lastly, um, facility uh, capital cost. And um, with that, um, if we go to the next slide, um, this slide is sort of just summarizes it all in... Um, uh, a number in, in a numbers um, schedule. On the left hand side, it, it shows you our final 2022 performance, um, what we're currently recommending in the proposed budget with uh, the changes that we're recommending. 
it, it shows you the net effect in um, each area on the revenues and on the expenditure side. So again, um, our recommendation is, is to um, make a reduction in our anticipated revenues of 7.7 .7 million um, while um, increasing the um, uh, recommended expenditure budget by 29.8 to cover the items that um, have come to our attention since the proposed budget was approved. Next slide, please. We have just a few more slides and wanted to cover changes in uh, the other funds that I mentioned. In our risk management fund, um, we had uh, uh, um, a need to look at increasing um, revenues uh, based on what we are we are currently earning an interest um, in that fund um, for the balance that we're holding, as well as balancing out the uh, transfers in from all of the other fund, um, all the other funds. Our risk management fund um, receives revenue from um, all of our operating funds in the form of uh, premiums. And so this is to balance out the premiums being charged to those funds um, and make sure that that the amount that we're charging in each of the operating funds equals what we're showing as the transfer in or the revenue to the risk management fund. And so we needed to make an adjustment of 1.6 million to ensure that um, balanced out. And on the expenditure side, um, we uh, um, recognized that we had not explicitly identified um, the need of a new um, case management system for the county attorney's office. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we had that covered in the risk management fund as well. Next slide, please. Special appropriations fund, I believe I covered this um, in our, uh, in, in my remarks um, earlier, but we increased revenues by 2.7 million and uh, associated expenditures by 2.7 million. And these are self-balancing funds. So they, um, they're, they're balanced either through the uh, revenues that are generated, um, and, and the fund balance available in each of the funds. Um, and so that, this is just to true, to true all of that up. Next slide, please. And then lastly, um, we share this with the board um, at each budget update, just sort of, and the chairman commented on this earlier, letting you know where we're at in the process. Um, we presented the proposed budget in November. Um, we held the official public hearing um, that's required by statute in uh, the first meeting of December. Um, holding that public hearing then set the board up to be able to approve the budget in its final form at either today's meeting or the second meeting uh, in January. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we're um, ready to take any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Good job, Madam CFO. Commissioner Ellis followed by Commissioner Hall. Well, first off, thanks for getting all this stuff together on a short week, um, and Akeem, I know you were up late, so we appreciate you sent, getting all this stuff packaged together. I told our clerk, I'm walking down this morning, I said, we gotta make a mental note that anytime we have a year that starts on Monday with a holiday, we need to, we need to move our meeting back a week, right? To, <laughs> particularly to give our finance staff some time since we uh, to close the books and get all the stuff together. So uh, appreciate you doing that. Um, just a, on a, a few questions, on the top line revenue, and I saw the adjustments and all that, that sort of stuff that went through what there. What page, Commissioner, you on? Uh, it's just really kind of a question about sort of the top, the revenue estimates and, and the assumptions behind those. I know uh, Ms. Whitmore went through kind of some changes in terms of the reductions. I don't really have a question on that, but my really my fundamental question is, what do we sort of build the, the revenue assumption from a, we added some revenue into the assumption, it was sort of, it could be loosely higher than I guess sort of a, a neutral millage rate. Um, did we leave that in there? I mean, sort of what sort of millage rate assumption are we, is this built upon? Is basically, is it still a flat plus maybe a slight, slight bump? It is, Commissioner. We, we, um, we built in the $16 million in, into, um, the uh, revenue appropriation is part of the proposed budget. We left that in, so that we left that in, but we did make adjustments where we for saw the timing step. 
yeah, for the timing stuff, and and where we saw that perhaps what we um, have had in the budget um, is not what we're actually generating in revenue in certain areas. Right. So we did make some other revenue. Categories. Yes. Right. Yeah. So in terms of as we're thinking about it right now, the way this budget's built, when we are sitting here in July, August, whenever that may be, setting a millage rate, um, this is loosely built upon something that would be a, and it's probably, a, you know, in, it would be, it would be high, it would be slightly higher than our existing millage rate. If, if, our gr the growth assumptions uh, played out the way they are here. Yes, sir. Okay. So I think that's important for us all to kind of have that as sort of a level set, right? You know, that, you know, the revenue assumption here is um, um, it's, it's banking on, you know, potentially a slightly higher millage rate. Not significant, but it's, it's uh, I don't know what sort of magnitude, but, you know, whatever whatever amount 16 million would amount to, that's... Um, Fractional millage rate bump. Um, on um, another thing, I guess, just sort of just for us to just note is, and really, this has been this has played out for the past several years. Um, but if you look at our revenues, right, and even where they were in the proposed the amended budget in 2022 of 750.4 million and an expenditure budget of 857.1 million. Um, those are, those are, would appear to be, you know, upside down. I think this is something for us to all to understand. You know, as it plays out, you know, the expenditures were significantly less than that um, and our revenues were slightly higher than that. Um, but still, you know, higher expenditures than what we had in, uh, in revenues. Uh, so we've had a pattern, and what I, what I just want to highlight this really for all of us, and particularly um, have some discussion with two of our new, with our two new commissioners that are coming on. Um, we've structurally had this thing going on with our budget where we've really been balancing our budget out of a significant level of surplus, which there's nothing wrong with. And that significant amount of surplus has been generated many times by, you know, good expense management um, and personnel roles are unfunded. Now, going into this year, we anticipated, we knew, we knew that we were going to not have as much sort of play in our budget, right? So you all, in, in your planning for this, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, so I understand it, you sort of built in some attrition rate into the individual departmental budgets. Is that correct? So I'm not going to be a prognosticator, but the potential likelihood that when we flash forward next year, the personnel savings that we have historically seen may not play out to be like what they have been going forward. That's right. They may not be at the same level. Right. So, you know, Again, our, you know, our budget, again, is sort of built structurally a little bit upside down, not as upside down as it was last year, but $802 million in revenue and $880 million as, um, as is proposed. Uh, but, it, you know, at some point, you know, in time, you know, optimally we would have these two balance out in terms of their presentation. Um, but if those, if those underruns don't play forth like they are, uh, like we've seen them here, when we get to next next year's budget discussion, we will be having a, a, a discussion about a significant shortfall again um, and how to solve for that. Correct? Yeah, right. yes, so, sir. So, I mean, so I just think as we go through this whole exercise, I think it's just something that we all need to, you know, keep in mind. I mean, every year it does sort of stand on its own and we set whatever millage rate we set to fund that particular year. Um, but... The actions do have, you know, an impact on future years. Um, so I just sort of point point those two those two things out. Um, on the um, getting down to some uh, maybe a few more granular points, um, I personally like the idea of. I mean, we have significant sort of facilities expenditures that are coming up 
you know, in the future, right? Some of these we know about, some of these we, we have funded for, we've had funding mechanisms for. Um, some other things we don't, we don't know the scope of, obviously, of what we're gonna have to do in terms of jail facilities in particular. Um, I, li I like, I'd like the idea that at a minimum we need to put some sort of, you know, reserve in our general fund budget to start to begin to be build some sort of down payment on whatever that looks like, you know. Um, if, if, our, if our amount is 22 and a half, um, you know, minimally, I feel like we need a, you know, a, a $10 million sort of down payment, whether 10 to 15, somewhere in that range. Um, on um, the, uh, the sheriff's components, I mean, I think that, the, I, I appreciate, so if you go back to the, the slide with, the, as I understand it, you know, you, you moved, uh, the sheriff's budget up 5.1 million, and the trade-off was to um, reduce the amount of non-agency associated with inmate outsourcing. That number is 28 million, and so that comes down. It, to it was, yes, okay, sir. So that 23 goes million to 23 now. or something, or 24.9, or 20, 22.9. Um, so, I mean, hopefully that will. That amount, if I looked at the sheriff's presentation in terms of, in terms of his desire to move to this, uh, which he has the authority to do, um, the, the comp time, um, the 48240 deal, that should match up, you know, with giving him the flexibility to take action on that within his, within his budget. Is that a fair way to look at that? Based on the document that the sheriff provided, which indicated um, a cost of $5.2 million if the um, overtime had all been paid in 2022, yeah, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Um, and then continue with, um, with, uh, with the sheriff's component. Um, I mean, I said this at the last meeting, you know, since I've been here, the one area that we have had continuous um, the highest vacancy rates in have been associated with folks, you know, doing detention work at the jail. Um, and that's been persistent, and obviously it's persistent today. So, I mean, I think the overtime components are important, um, and I don't want to diminish those, but I think, you know, structurally, trying to do something to kind of change the narrative on that and de deal with, you know, kind of this persistent sort of vacancy rate we have is important, and I think, we talked about it at the last meeting, and uh, the sheriff's again brought this forward again, and I think he highlighted that this would, was sort of his most important thing he felt like that needed to be done was to do something with, with pay for the detention officers and deputies that are, that are working in the jail. So, um, I mean, I, I, I know in the slide he, he had shown, um, you know, some different options. I mean, I sort of like something in the, and what other people think about it. And I'm interested in listening to the remarks on that, but something, you know, in the allocating something in the range of, you know, 10 million or so out of that 22 and a half to, uh, for compensation related to this uh, particular topic for the detention officers and, and working through what that will exactly look like. Um, so that's my remarks on the, the sheriff's component. And uh, the, the last is sort of a question. Um, the the election two two questions sort of on the elections budget one I want to just sort of highlight really for as we get into the elections discussion next year and I noted this you know when we were starting to have earlier discussions on this that we needed a crisp elections budget um, and I'll talk about it again I know next year you know the way the but this the budget is built right now as I understand it is really more just it's a non-election year, so this is more just the existing staff and operational costs plus the over the overrun or the invoices haven't been paid from the prior elections. Is that generally speaking what's in the registration elections budget right now? Um, yes, and then we have a um, a separate reserve for the cost of a one special call election that's okay. in non-agency. So that's in non-agency. What is yes, what is sir. that amount? Uh, Fifteen million. Um, okay, hey, that's probably worth having, coming back and having some level of conversation around that. But that's a, we got 15 million that's sort of sitting there, you know, as a contingency for that. 
Um, but, you know, one thing just to just really point out, and we had this, you know, had this conversation when we started, when we did a budget last year for registrations and election, and it was 37.4, and it was a lot of comments from elections that that wasn't enough. So that's number one. And then number two, as it was built, it was built assuming, it was built without a two runoffs occurring, right? Sorry, I turned it off. As I recall, we funded three of the um, four three of the potential four. cycles, yes. So we funded, we, we, we budgeted to fund three of the four. There were some comments from elections that maybe the budget wasn't enough, but flash forward through and we ran all of the elections at what looks to be, you know, a cost of, well, in, you know, this would include their, their going, going operational cost of, what is that, 20, 28.1 million? That about, yes. Right, so 9 million or so less than what the budget was, plus whatever we had had set aside. Well, we didn't have it set aside. We said we were gonna find it, right, if we needed to, and we didn't need to. So my point being with this is it's, it's a discussion really for next year, you know, but there, since we were here at this point in time, I mean, doing the work to try to look at what is a real budget? Because, I mean, this is not, I mean, I'm not, this is not a criticism of their performance within the elections. This is really just about budgeting. We can't have that significant of a, of a gap. I mean, we all know this, you know, the running of elections has been a huge moving target with COVID, SB202, and all that sort of stuff. So maybe there were some assumptions in here that were, you know, we didn't know how they were gonna play out, but you know, we can't have that kind of miss, if you will. Uh, which brings me to, you know, kind of a, it's not within, you know, I guess sort of, we do run municipal elections, but we IGA those out and the, those costs will be shared. So the assumption really is on the municipal elections is that we'll pass on those costs. And there's not really a factor that would, you know, cost for municipals are not you know, are not factored into our general fund budget because those would be passed on, correct? That, that's correct. Um, but they'll, we'll have sort of a, we should see some sort of general budget from them about what that would look like and what the what the IGA structures will be and all that. We'll have to, they'll have to bring that forward to us to approve that, correct? Y yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, I think those are my remarks in terms of um, the budget, but thank you all for your work. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Commissioner Hall. You mean Vice Chair Bob Ellis? <laughs> that almost sounded like you were calling me Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to commend um, our Madam CFO, Sharon Whitmore, our Finance Director, Hakeem, and the County Manager and all the County Executives on pulling this together, that was quite a feat uh, coming off of the holiday. And I can tell you that my chief of staff and I were watching the emails like crazy and, and we know how hard it probably was for you to just even get it to us last night. So I commend you on this. And, but you know, I never wavered in my confidence of you balancing the budget and finding additional funding. Because one of the things that uh, I recall is over the years, even as chief of staff to the late Commissioner Joan P. Garner, um, Commissioner Garner and Commissioner Darnell used to always say that if anybody could find some money, it was definitely going to be our CFO, Sharon Whitmore, and that you don't have to worry about the budget because that's why Sharon has been here so long. She knows exactly how to balance this budget and where to find funding. And one of the other things that I learned early on from the tax commissioner is that during the first quarter of each year, there is always additional funding that comes in that we don't account for in our previous budget when we're looking at the coming year. And so there is always an opportunity for more funding uh, to show up in the first quarter. And so um, I'm glad to see that you have... Um, put this together and found this additional funding. And, and I'm so happy to see the increase. Let me 
me see, what page was that? On page 15 of 5.1 plus million dollars to the sheriff's budget um, to increase it to the amount that uh, he was asking for, that is an, an absolute plus. Thank you for that. I'm glad to see that in the book. And uh, also, I want to just say that it, it is very important um, to me that we give our CFO and our finance director the opportunity to do the work uh, because I do recall, and Hakeem, you may remember this, coming in as a new commissioner, Commissioner Darnell called a meeting and she pulled you and your staff into the conference room on the 10th floor just to meet with me because she, she had that much confidence in the finance department and you and Sharon. And we sat down and literally went over the entire budget and um, I remember that. And, and Commissioner Garner, Commissioner, after Commissioner Garner's passing, Commissioner Darnell always met with me several times every month, but what was most important to me were those meetings before the BOC meetings, and she always spoke highly of finance. I want to go back to um, page nine in the presentation, the portion about the decrease of $1.2 million to external affairs due to the transfer of FGTV and Fulton Films personnel and operations effective February 1st, 2023. And I just want to say congratulations to David Manuel and Jessica Corbett because this will give David the opportunity to move toward national trends of focusing on creative industries and it gives Jessica an opportunity to focus on external affairs and intergovernmental affairs and communications countywide since the census 2020 has shown that we've had significant growth in our, resident, in our residents. And so congratulations to both of you and also to FGTV and Fulton Films and Shania Chavis. I think this is an opportunity for the county to continue to be the best that it already is and just showing that we are always ahead of the curve. Um, I want to go down to the IT operations, contractual staff. Oh, and I'm sorry, and, and thank you um, to our COO, Pam, Dr. Pamela Rochelle as well, because you worked so hard on these transitions. I want to go to um, the IT department line on page nine of the presentation and just ask, are we keeping track of the contractors and how long we are keeping them on board? Because I do, um, I've heard you say something about personnel and that they're trying to fill vacant positions in IT. And I, I have to always keep um, track of the audit that happened. The IT audit revealed a lot of things in IT that are still some issues that we need to, you know, just make sure that we're keeping track of. And the contractors was one of them. Contractors being on board too long beyond the, um, the implementation of new systems and programs and the need for a transfer of knowledge and training of the IT employees on those new systems and programs. And then making sure that if there is a need for us to have full-time employees to manage those systems and applications that we move toward that and do a transfer of knowledge from the contractors to our full-time county employees and so are we keeping are we doing that i see you shaking your head alton <laughs> no those are all great questions uh, commissioner and and just to provide a little more information on this particular uh request we have some very specific, we've had turnover in a couple of really important areas. Um, networking, for example, our manager of networks has left. And so we, oh. we're, trying, we, we're recruiting for that role, but it's a role that we really need to have. Yes. And so what we're looking for is short-term interim staffing to help us support, to support us there. We've had some losses in the SharePoint, SharePoint support area as well that specifically supports a lot of what we do in the tax commissioner's office. 
So what we're looking for is to have individuals come in short-term basis, no, no more than a year, and ideally less than that as we continue to, to search and, and hire individuals <coughs> in those areas. But because they are so critical to our day-to-day -day function, we felt the need to, uh, to enhance and bring in some short-term resources. And to your point about, about transfer, in some ways we're going to accomplish that when we, when we do in fact hire the full-time staff. So our goal is not to turn them into full-time staff. Concurrent with the short-term solve here, we're going to be recruiting to bring individuals in on a full-time basis. That's great. I'm um, sorry to hear that we lost people. Is this due to salaries or? Uh, technology is just a, just a lot of turnover, right? There's a lot of demand. Um, a lot of it started with COVID, right, and individuals staying at home. But as, you, as you're probably aware, virtually every technology company has decided that Atlanta is going to be their southeastern <coughs> hub. Yes. And so individuals are moving from one technology firm to another. So we're not unlike a number of other organizations that have had gaps and have had losses in this area. I think we're making up some ground. But, but IT in particular, as you know, when we came forward at the beginning of the year, to request additional salary increases, it was because we had seen turnover and the inability to attract resources at the level that we need them. Great, so we have um, been using those um, things that we instituted to ensure that we're attracting the talent and like the bonuses and the uh, salary adjustments and, and those sort of things? Yes, absolutely, they've been very helpful. Uh, okay. we've, gotten, we've gotten close to, to what I'd consider to be market rate for a number of these functions, Great. so they have been very helpful in terms of being able to, uh, to improve the, uh, the staffing. And I might just add um, to your question, we review every other week as a senior team IT, and specifically the staffing, the hiring, uh, any of the gaps that exist, in addition to major project um, updates. So every other week, the collective we are looking at that. Okay, that's good, that's good. And so, let me see. Okay. Yep, that's it, thank you so much. Thanks, Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, um, I have some follow-on questions really to uh, what Vice Chair Ellis was asking about, um, specifically on the millage rate. Um, Vice Chair Ellis asked approximately what is it based on and approximately what will it need to be. I'm just wondering, can we get more granular on that specifically? What is this budget based on millage rate-wise and what does it need to be mid-year when we vote on it specifically? We can do the the best that we can to give you a specific number, but the millage rate is based on the values that are set as of January 1. We won't have that information until next June. So I, we can tell you what we're basing it off of right now. Well, that's what, I, yeah. I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying. So it's, it's based off of um, what this year's millage rate produced with a 3% growth and billable um, value for next year. So, Plus this $16 million, which is a little more than two-tenths of a mill adjustment. I apologize for interrupting. Um, so it's based on no increase in the millage rate, the, this current budget. The um, millage rate specifically, not the, other, the revenue based on that. No, I wouldn't say it's, it's based on no increase in the millage rate. Uh, because we built in $16 million of additional revenue, um, that will have to be covered next year. And, and that is a little more than two-tenths of a mill. Okay. Um, but we won't know what the exact millage rate will need to be until we get the valuation data, which we get um, typically in June. Okay, but so then I, I think my next question is a connection of the two subjects that Vice Chair Ellis brought up because he talked about the millage rate first, and then he talked about the fact that we continually budget, um, and I don't know if I have the accounting terminology right, but at a deficit where our revenues are lower than our expenses. And um, so if you're putting those two topics together, what, what is it gonna take for us to start running our operations so that we're not upside down in that way? Um, and by the way, I'm also thinking about the fact that 
um, our, our, our county manager started his comments out by saying there are $250 million in additional requests that we haven't even considered. So we're already spending more than we're bringing in and we're not addressing all the needs we need to address. So I'm just sort of puzzled about how this is sustainable in the long term. So in, in I guess in absolute values, um, if you look at the, the difference between revenue and expenditures and you assume that everything in the expenditure budget is a recurring expense, then we're about $77 million off between revenue being able to support the recurring expense. Um, that's a little more than um, a one mil adjustment. If you're, if you're talking about what do you have to do to, to make your revenues match your planned expenditures. So that would be a little more than a one mil um, adjustment. So we currently get about 62 or 63 million um, from, from a mill, so we would need about a one mill adjustment to correct that. Um, but not everything that's proposed is proposed to be a, um, a recurring expense. So there are some items in the budget that are not intended to be a recurring expense. Um, but just in pure numbers, if you made the assumption that the 879.9 million is 100% recurring, then we would need a little more than a mill um, to a mill adjustment in order to balance out recurring revenue to that number. I'm not sure what the recurring part, why that's relevant, because the numbers are for the year. Right, for the year, yes. So, but but so I, so, so I, I interpreted your question to be the law uh, like a long term. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But the budget's going to change. The requirements are going to change year over Annually. year if we have yes, more elections in a particular yes. year or whatever the case may be. Um, I have concerns about this budget going forward with these assumptions because we have some huge problems in the county. Listen, we have a great county. Don't get me wrong, but we have issues around public health, and we have uh, with the hospital closures, and we have issues around public safety with the jail, and we're not, we don't appear to be addressing those things with this current budget, so are we just kicking the can down the field another year? I'm just sort of puzzled about how we start to address these things. So one thing that, that might be helpful, it's a great question, is we do produce a long-term view, multi-year, generally five, so in the process for producing this budget, we constructed that same view inclusive of everything that we knew to be on the horizon, not necessarily endorsed by the board at this point in time, um, that millage rate would climb, even with the assumptions that we use on the base growth, to 12 to 13 from what was then 9.33. The board made the decision, not speaking for them, that in light of the economics of, or the economy and the pressure on citizens to reduce the millage rate. So you're right, it doesn't really address long-term needs. It did address short-term pressures that citizens were feeling, and therein is the sometimes, often, the conundrum. One other thing, the, one of the good pieces of financial discipline news that we have is for three years running, not this year, but three years previous, our revenues have exceeded our expenses. Not because they were budgeted in that way, but the financial management of expenses during the course of the year has produced revenues being in excess of expenses. Each year, though, when we go through this budget process, there's a huge amount of pressure to use whatever is in the um, reserve that's not required to be in the reserve to augment the budget. And therein is how we get into the discussion of revenues being less than expenses, because we could construct a budget where the two are in balance or better in balance. Uh, than they normally are, and generally, except for this last year where we did a lot of employee compensation enhancements to address attrition and inflation, it has worked out that way, but not necessarily planned for in that way. So I, I think your questions are right on point. Um, I, I want to get a little bit more granular on the sheriff's presentation and, um, and the numbers there, uh, because I know we've talked about this a couple times now, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. So I understand that there's that $5.1 million that's being sort of put back into his budget from the uh, staff attrition number, but um, 
but what, where are we on his chart here that he presented um, with the current budget? Are we at the 20% proposed pay increase? Are we at the current, where, where are we? I'm a little bit lost on that, on this, this uh, that he presented. Um, his budget would be based on current pay. Okay, so, it, so we have the option because we have a little, either by increasing the millage rate um, or by um, using the reserve that we did not expect to have to sort of potentially pick one of these levels he's presented before we finalize this budget, correct? Um, and it sounded like yes. uh, Vice Chair Ellis was recommending the sort of middle ground or not even sort of, you know, kind of two up from the bottom there at the $10 million mark. I'm just wondering if anybody else has any thoughts about that, uh, about where we should land. But I'd like to see us at least um, at the $10 million mark in addition for him, if not the next level up. I mean, I'd like to see him get the whole thing, to be honest, but I'm just not sure what other priorities we need to fit in. Um, I did tour the jail um, before I took office, and I did see the lack of staffing there, and I you know, I did speak to some of the, uh, the folks there, and it seems like a very, very desperate need. So I'd like to see that, uh, uh, you know, adjusted for before we sign off on this budget. And we'll have an opportunity to go dig a little deeper into that at our, at our next, because I do not anticipate us approving the budget today, but at the next meeting, uh, we certainly, it's my intention that we'll approve it at the next meeting. And there'll be a lot of discussion about what the sheriff, another award-winning presentation has made today. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. Uh, great questions. Commissioner Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharon, Dick, um, and your teams for your thoughtful consideration of the budget. Uh, I would just like to suggest that we, you know, assume... And I understand that you're saying, I guess, maybe there's an additional $16 million that will be added. I would like to suggest that we assume that there would be an increase in the millage rate for purposes of this budget. And then, you know, I guess we, we, time will tell whether, whether we actually do that increase or not. Um, I wish that we had done it this year, but we didn't. But I think for purposes of the budget, for purposes of planning, particularly, Mr. Manager, when you say, hey, we've exceeded revenue, revenue has exceeded expenses over the last three years, you know, let's anticipate um, that there would be an increase. And I understand that typically you, you overestimate expenses and underestimate revenue, but I think Commissioner Barrett's point is, is important. You know, there's an additional 250 million in requests, right? Um, and so there's a delicate balance between fulfilling all of those requests and making sure that we are using the money that we have as efficiently as possible and not wastefully. So um, I would just like to, for you all to assume that there would be a millage rate increase. I would like, you know, even if it's at the, the amount, millage rate that you all recommended that we adopt this year, right? Um, and so then I think that gives, hopefully that makes Sharon and Hakeem's job a little easier. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Thorne. Um, I'll be quick. Um, the $250 million in additional requests, do we have a list of what was not put in the budget? Yes, ma'am. We do, and we'll, um, we'll send that to you, um, to, to both of you. Um, I think... I thought that we had included it in your binder, but if we if we did not, then I'll make sure that we, we get it to you. We have a full list of everything that was requested, what was funded, and what was not. And then how does it work with the, the risk management fund, um, the revenue, a $2 million increase? I don't quite understand how that projection could... So the risk management fund um, is funded through premiums that we charge to um, all the other operating funds. And in reconciling um, what amount we're charging for support of the county attorney's office, the county attorney's actual operating budget is in the risk management fund. So when we reconciled what we were charging for support of the county attorney's office um, versus what was actually shown as the revenue source within the risk management fund, we saw that it was lower 
and we needed to raise it up to balance out with what we have already programmed into the expenditure budgets um, everywhere else to make sure that the um, funding that her office needs for support um, is, is fully provided to the risk management fund from all of the other funds. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, other comments at this time? So, uh, Madam CFO, if you would make yourself available to the board uh, between now and the 18th, I'd appreciate it because we need to approve it. Uh, I think you all have done a great job. It's balanced, and I'm pleased with where we are. Continue, Madam Clerk. Continuing on page 7 under Health and Human Services, 23-0016, Public Works, request approval of the lowest responsible bidder in an amount not to exceed 131923 to provide landscaping restoration services. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passed this unanimously. 23-0017, request approval of an IGA between Fulton County and the city of Johns Creek for water main relocations associated with the road improvements to Haynes Bridge Road and an right. estimated amount of $1,235,675. Motion on the floor is to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Cast your vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. Commissioner's action items 230018, request approval of a resolution in observance of the 94th birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Motion to approve by Commissioner Abdul Rahman, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. Vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. 230019, request approval of a memorandum of understanding between Fulton County, Georgia, and Core Community Organized Relief Effort, a nonprofit for the use of county warehouse and office space in exchange for in-kind services, sponsored by Chairman Pitts. I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Uh, Mr. Kalmar, come on up, please. Let me just put this in its context, and Commissioner Hall has a question. summarize what we're doing yes sir happy new year everyone what we have in front of us is a mou with core really what you're looking for is you look on page six of it breaking down to the brass tax is really what is offering core space in exchange for their personnel and resources during times of emergency as you know core has been an incredible partner to us during the last couple of years we're getting into those pockets of our community that we have had a difficult time of vaccinating and as we continue this relationship with him, is just having something that we could go ahead and hold accountable, both parties to be able to say, you're in our space, you're leveraging our warehouse space, but at the same time allowing us opportunity to leverage their staff as well as their resources for future emergencies, whether it be man-made or natural. So they like to use this as kind of a hub for other responses in our community, and we look to partner with them in that regard. I think it would be a mutually beneficial uh, type of a relationship that enhances Fulton County's ability to be able to respond to the citizens that we serve. All right, Commissioner Hall, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is um, free space, use of county warehouse and office space in exchange for in-kind services, but I, I couldn't find what the services currently are. You'll see inside there, ma'am, it would be based upon the fact that it would be the, the six staff as well as the 11,000 square feet worth of resources that they bring to the table. A lot of the things that they have are things that can be used after a tornado response or a flood uh, that can happen in the community. So what we'll be able to do is leverage those resources. We won't really have to procure those ourselves. They'll have those inside of the warehouse that we can leverage for our citizens tarps, rakes, shovels, things along those lines. I think it would be a truly a benefit in that regard. How much space is it and what exactly are we leveraging right now? Right now it's 11,000 square feet based upon the MOU. Currently what they have is a space at our warehouse of 4,700. They've cohabitated with us during the operations of this response. They still have state uh, contracts at this time to continue to do vaccination efforts. 
Uh, they're here doing vaccination efforts every Wednesday in our uh, um, county facility over here at the government center. So this partnership is, is one that's definitely mutually beneficial for both parties in that regard. Well, I'm glad to see it because um, since the very beginning of my um, of me becoming a commissioner, I have received consistently requests from our nonprofit partners who are actually doing the work with our residents um, constantly on a daily basis because that's what they do. And we fund them, a lot of them, um, through our grant programs, but I've consistently received requests from them to have some kind of co-working space or office space um, with the county so that they can be closer to the residents that they serve in the county. And I know at some point, Dr. Rochelle and um, our county manager, Dick Anderson, were working toward that effort of trying to find space. So I'd like to uh, hear an update on that since we happen to find so much space for CORE and um, I just, I want, I'd like an update. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner. We are working with DREAM to stand up an application process for the use of any existing space that we have. Um, the process would identify specific needs that we have in the community. It would be outcomes based and it would definitely be connected to the funding that we are providing to organizations. So that is the, the method that we are thinking through, which would be an application process so that it is a fair process that we would advertise, it would be an application and organizations could apply. Uh, of course, the space would be limited, but again, it would be through an application process that would have identified outcomes, um, terms of the agreement as far as occupancy and the, the length of that, that occupancy. Well, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, let me just tell you about a county that is already doing this and they were featured during one of the National Association of Counties conferences, the, the last one that was in Colorado, and that would be Adams County, Colorado. There is a, they literally set aside uh, office space where their nonprofit partners actually come every day and assist the residents of their county. They literally do this in the same building with all of the other county resources. So it makes it a lot easier to provide that constituent with the wraparound services that they need. So they may very well be a veteran and go up to the second floor of the Adams County building to the veteran's office and then be sent downstairs to one of the veterans' nonprofit partners that's in the co-working space in the same building. So you can, um, they have the legislation. There is a commissioner, uh, his name um, slips my mind right now, but there is one commissioner that literally sponsored and pushed this forward through their board of commissioners and they all said that it was the best thing that they could have ever done for their constituents. Uh, thank you for, sh for sharing that model, Commissioner Hall. I will certainly look into that. We certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel if there is a best practice out there that's working among our other counties. So thank you for that. Great, and this is a, a good start. Now, you know, the governor declared a state of emergency prior to the freezing weather. So is CORE currently helping us uh, while we're mitigating the disasters across the county from the freeze? At this time, that actually declaration did uh, expire last week, Tuesday, so there is no continuing that emergency declaration. Uh, when it comes to CORE in this particular response, there has been no requests that we have received from the public for additional support. Anything that we did hear about, Red Cross did go ahead and work with those individuals to try to support them, as well as the housing units in the apartment complexes that these individuals lived in. Those communities have to step up and support those individuals but we have not had any specific that I'm aware of uh, calls for service for a community organized release effort. So how will that look moving forward since this is based on natural disasters and those, type of, those types of situations? 
I think we'd have to look to see what they have in their repertoire that can help in a freezing type of event. Right now, the resources that I'm aware of that they have in their cache is more for straight line winds, tornadoes, flooding, things along those lines, things that we have seen that happened in Kentucky and places along those lines, in Florida and Louisiana. So they have taken the resources, respond to those communities, set up the grassroots effort like they have done in our community to go ahead and start that re recovery and response process there. And that's what we're looking for in this type of relationship. It would be within our space in the warehouse, so it's not an additional space that's carved out for them. We're making uh, space within our allocation of the warehouse to be able to accomplish this. We're looking at it, once again, as that mutually beneficial relationship. We don't have to procure some of these items because they'll have it available for our use. I also want to make note that on several occasions, or probably just about every BOC meeting, we've had um, a resident named Lydia Meredith come forward and ask for space for the defects children. And, um, and currently, if I'm not mistaken, is working with the district attorney and our county executives, uh, Joe Davis and some others on how to get that space um, at the Fairburn Road location. And so I would like for you to consider that. If we can do this, we can do these other things as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Arrington. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm having a little pause with this. Uh, Madam CFO, how much money did we pay the Corps over the last, oh, throughout this pandemic? I'd have to look that up, multiple millions. At least five million? I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look, Commissioner Arrington. If you give me a minute, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm trying to understand. I feel like we, all that stuff they store, and I feel like we already paid for it. I feel like it's ours. I I, I don't under I don't I don't understand how we pay them millions and then we give them free space. So I I need a little help with that. I, I and and I I trust your judgment, and I, I mean you're making the recommendation, so that gives me some comfort. But I'm trying to understand how do how do we pay them millions and give them free space? Help help that make sense to me because that 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 doesn't make sense to me. That's a valid question. It's absolutely a valid question. The resources that we have through the COVID response is actually on the west side of the warehouse that we can leverage. So those type of things that have been procured throughout this response. Uh, Ms. Lee said that her team will make sure that remains with us in the future for any type of public health emergency response. The resources that they have, they're being brought to bearers from other phil philanthropic donations and other things that they have. So well, there's never been a need for garbage cans, rakes, shovels, things along those lines, um, tarps during this type of COVID response. These are other things that they have brought in through their other avenues that they have done. So we're leveraging those resources that we've never paid for, sir. Okay. Um, all right, and then um, I had another question. So, do we, so we're getting the, the six people, is that it? Is that the total number of people that they're donating? It'll be, it'll be four cubicles worth of space, sir, and two offices. So the individuals that are assigned there, we leverage those individuals. Right now, if we have a big delivery that comes in, those folks come over and support our team on only in the truck. Uh, when it came to the Vista Forge exercise that we really recently ran uh, with our Department of Defense individuals, we took all those six individuals to help our staff actively run that exercise. So it's this nice symbiotic relationship that we have. Sometimes if they have to go ahead and push some things out, we support them with loading the truck and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a good force, force multiplier without having to go out and hire additional staff just for those little blurbs that we need additional support. All right, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I can go along with, with, with your recommendation. I'm, I'm still somewhat hesitant. Like for me, I would wanna know, okay, what is the, what is the value of, what is the fair market rental value of the space 
versus the six people, does does that equal out? I, you know, I, those are the type of questions that I have. And, you know, certainly based on your track record and your history, I can maybe look the other way, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still having a little difficulty with this. I appreciate, I guess, that you're saying that they are also donating resources and getting other things. And you have more of a bird's eye view of that than I do. So that, th that's why I would give deference to your recommendation. But for my perch, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that view. Um, but your concerns are extremely valid, sir. Your concerns are extremely valid. And I would ask the same questions if I was sitting in your chair as well. I think that Miss Lee has made an incredible investment in our community. And it's um, something that I would hate for us to go ahead and just lose as we start to see this response trail off. I, I feel that it is uh, imperative for us to figure out how to go ahead and continue this type of um, capability development within our community. The one thing that was so incredible about it is that they look for people within our, in our city, our county, to be able to go ahead and pull us all up by the bootstraps. And that was something that was really intoxicating when you got to see their model when we first saw it when they were over at Mercedes-Benz Home Depot backyard. And I think that's what's helped this relationship grow. Am I perfect? No. Uh, but I think that this is something that could help us get stronger. And uh, right now, everything seems to go ahead and look like it's definitely headed in the positive direction for this type of a relationship. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Ellis. I did share some of the concerns that uh, Commissioner Arrington noted. I, I do think you know, these types of agreements on 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 paper, and that's sort of, not on paper, but in theory, a lot of times I do think, well, they may sound good, but there are a lot of unintended consequences to doing a lot of facility use agreements and becoming a landlord. Um, so I think we gotta be really cautious about that, and we've got limitations on our own space, and which really brings me to my the core of my question, unintended, um, is, um, Where's this warehouse space going to be? I mean, we don't. We, I, to my understanding, we got a shortage of it as it is, until this new facility opens up. And the space where it's at is not intended to be a warehouse, but we've sort of made it into an ad hoc warehouse where we've delayed building that out to expand, you know, services to citizens. So, kind of help me out with that component of it. We feel very blessed that we had 4,700 available at the time to do what mm -hmm. we had to do for the right. community. We know that ultimately it's gonna be programmed for a different type of an operation. The beautiful thing right now is that it's very linear in the sense of how we're storing things there. We have minimal rack space. Uh, we try to go up vertical in the places we can, but there's a lot of places we can't because once again, it was never built to hold that much weight per square foot. So right. we're looking forward to having a very good vertical space in this new warehouse. I know Dream has done a lot of work with the architects to be able to accomplish that, and we feel that we'll be able to go ahead and live together with them, allowing us to go vertical in our storage. Okay, so this, you know, the, the space we're envisioning, sort of long term, and the new warehouse is slated to open up in the third quarter? When are, we, when are we slating that to open up? I was told around second or third quarter this year, sir. I think the plan is to start Joe, jump in. I think the plan is to start moving um, registration and elections in first right. um, during the first quarter of this year um, with the, the balance of the agencies that are moving in being moved in towards um, uh, the, the middle part or the end of, end of the year. Okay. So this, the plan is just for to be in the footprint of not in additional space, but within the footprint that was originally programmed for emergency, emergency management. management. Yes. Sir. Okay. So it's yes, not new space. This is just yes, within. Okay. That's helpful to understand. So you're, and I'm, I maybe mean, I'm hearing you say this, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'll ask you this question. And you can kind of respond to it. Um, what I also seem to be hearing is that this is a good way for you to gain staff, particularly during times of emergency response, that you don't otherwise have? It would be an easy way to have a quick force multiplication effort. So okay. if, um, if you're looking for a long-term need, it would not mm -hmm. go ahead and fulfill 
planning efforts and community outreach efforts and exercises, things along those lines. But when it comes to a response, right. you wouldn't have to go ahead and to do contract a quick that. little uh, temp workers to come in and help unload vehicles and be able to go ahead and re-push allocations of resources out to okay. our cities. So the agreement, in exchange for that, they will be acting yes, sir. In, those, in that type of effort? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay. All right. That, that's, that's helpful. Thanks. Yes, sir. Commissioner Abdu Rockman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I agree with this, but I do want to ask the county manager and uh, maybe even the chairman, when, when I look at this and I think about uh, Canaan, uh, um, the canine sailmates situation, uh, we know that is a program that has been working, Chairman, that I, I believe you were the one that brought it to fruition and it's in kind with our jails. Um, right now, the moratorium is holding up the process, and I know that they have to move by January 8th. Can this similarity of this be at, uh, looked at for the situation with uh, uh, the canine cellmates? It seems to me to be similar. I'll, of course, if anybody want to weigh in and educate me, but it seems to be a similar situation, so I'm wondering, if we can apply this same framework, so to speak, to that particular situation, especially since, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but I think January 8th, they are supposed to be out. And one of the reasons that we cannot move forward with them being over at Union City is because of the moratorium. So I'm wondering if we can look at this and see how that situation can work. You all may be working on it. I know you all were working on it, but I'm just asking. Uh, in fact, when Commissioner Hall mentioned the situation for Fab and Road, that's what made me think about it because we do have a lot of nonprofits that do stuff with us, but the fact that the, they are doing it with our jails in kind services. So I'm just wondering if you all, you can weigh in now or you can, you know, we can talk later about it, but I just wanted to see, because it looks similar to me. Commissioner, if I can, uh, we've actually been in um, frequent contact with Susan at uh, K-9 Summit. In fact, she sent me a text a few minutes ago, and we're looking at, at two things. One, number one priority is finding a place for the 15 dogs that uh, need to be relocated. And as you know, our, our shelter is overcrowded, but we, we're looking at some options. I think we found an option for that. And secondly, she does have some things that need some storage in the short term while we figured out how to, you know, kind of recreate and, and expand the program that she's managing. So both of those are underway, and Matt and his team and, and Lifeline and others have been involved in trying to make sure that we deal with her situation before she has to move out on, uh, on January 8th. So we are intervening. That's what, that's what I'm getting from you. Uh, absolutely. We're partnering. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Arrington, it's 106. Okay. Um... I guess this question is really more for the county attorney. I'm, lo I'm looking at this contract, and I think it might need a, a little more flushing out. Um, so I heard Matt say the six people, but I, I don't see that in the contract, right? Section 1.4 and 1.5 kind of address CORE's responsibilities and the county's responsibilities. and. Um, basically what it says is CORE will provide disaster relief assistance as it typically performs for those to which it renders aid. <laughs> what does that mean? Who, who do, what are the standards for which they normally render aid? What, what, I think that needs to be flushed out, okay? Uh, the next paragraph, 1.5, CORE will support the Fulton County Emerging Management Agency with core resources and staff during the response and recovery phases. Again, I hear you, Matt, saying that that's six people, but the, the contract doesn't require that. Th that could be one person. Are they full-time? Are they part-time? What? I mean, I just I think it needs to be flushed out a little bit more, at least the, the contract does, perhaps, and, you know, Maybe you have an understanding and the verbal agreement, but now we're talking about the written agreement. 
And so I, I would just ask um, Madam County Attorney, I'm, you know, I'm willing to support this, but at, at the very least 1.4 and 1.5 need to be fleshed out so we know exactly what we're getting, when, where, and how. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Barrett. I'll be quick. Um, I just, I, I definitely support this. I just think it seems like there's a lot of questions about how much we're getting in return. And I, rec I noticed when I was reading the, uh, the memor memorandum that it's a 90 day out, I believe. And um, so it seems to me if we just get maybe a quarterly update on how it's going and how much we're actually getting in return and how much we're actually using um, their efforts, that might be helpful um, going forward so we can end it if it's not working for us and or renew it if it is. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. The motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote, please. The vote is open. Attorney, you could make the adjustments that, connect, that Commissioner Arrington referenced. We would be happy to work okay. with the department thank to you. include All more right. detail. Let's vote. Appreciate your favorable vote. And the motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you. It is 109. I entertain a motion to recess for lunch. Executive session where we'll discuss items of real estate litigation and personnel. Please vote. And the vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously.
Are you ready? Just turn it on. Just go. Without objection, we will resume the regular order of business. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Clerk. Bottom of page seven. Twin excuse me. Oh. I'm so sorry, Chairman Pitts, but may I please um, address the action item from executive session? Yes. Is there a motion to approve the request for representation set forth in item number one of the executive session agenda? We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Abdul Rockman, seconded by Vice Chair Ellis. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. Bottom of page seven, 230020, request approval of an ordinance to amend chapter 101, division two, section 107, 101-72 of the Fulton County Code of Ordinances to further safeguard and prevent the disclosure of confidential executive session discussions and to provide penalties for any violation and for other purposes, sponsored by Chairman Pitts. Or we have a, <coughs> excuse me, a motion to approve by Commissioner Abdul Rockman, seconded by Commissioner Hall. And this quick explanation, actually self-explanatory, but this seeks to put some teeth <coughs> into the what's on our books already regarding disclosure of confidential information, any confidential information that may be disclosed, disclosed or discussed within executive session. We've had incidents in the past where uh, that has happened. I can recall at least one instance in which we uh, censured a member of this body and fined that person $1,000, which she did not, never paid. So <clears throat> with this legislation, and there have been instances, recent ones, by the way, uh, and I won't go into any detail on that, but we all know uh, situations that are topics that we've discussed recently in executive session. And, and uh, I used to tell a story that after executive session, after the conclusion of a meeting, <clears throat> my chief of staff would know everything that we talked about in executive session. So this is a, an attempt to strengthen that. I think it's satisfactory, although... Recording in progress. Although, <clears throat> this would require a supermajority vote, which means five affirmative votes, for anyone found to be in violation of this, assuming it passes. And the two sanctions, would, well, one sanction would be a public repr reprimand through a censure uh, resolution. And a fine at $1,000, which would be deducted from your comp Fulton County compensation. I don't think the $1,000 is enough. I recommend it $10,000, but the county attorney uh, objected to that. So what's before us is a censure, public censure, and a fine of $1,000. So Commissioner Abdul Rockman, Commissioner Barrett, Commissioner Hall. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm in full support of this. I just would like to make sure that our county attorney uh, adds the needed language in accordance with staff and as, as how we view staff, the staff that's present in executive session. You know, what, what Commissioner Hall brought up as a valid point. Um, I, I would really like to see that language in there as well. Thank you, Commissioner Abdurrahman. We would be happy to add language that um, clarifies that staff uh, is specifically staff present for the executive session. All right. Anything else, Commissioner? No, thank you. Thank right. you, Chairman. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Chairman. I just have two quick things. Um, one, the way this is worded, it's, it's uh, the member of this board that uh, receives these penalties, does this also hold for s staff that are in the meetings? Because it's worded like only member. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, the staff who are in meetings are uh, employees of the county in a more traditional sense, and therefore they have a supervisory chain who can um, enforce disciplinary actions that are required for violations of policy okay. because commissioners um, sit on the governing authority uh, the governing authority itself acts as your own supervisory chain, and that's why it's specific to commissioners, because 
um, the board itself is the only way for you to um, supervise those functions. Thank you. And then the other thing I have is on page five, uh, line 115, where it talks about the, um, the penalty. It says uh, sanctions against the violating member to include but not limited to a public reprimand and then the, the $1,000. And I'd like to have that not limited to taken out of there. It doesn't seem, it seems pretty open-ended that it could be $1,000 and a public sanction and I don't know, whatever else. You lose your office and your committee is, I mean, you know, it's sort of open-ended. I just like to have it tightened up. If the board votes to approve um, that uh, amended language, we would be happy to remove the, but not limited to. Um, but that is, that is not the, what is before the board but now. What did you say, County, Madam County? If it is the will of the board to amend that language as well, we will be happy to well, remove that. Well, is it helpful that, to not to? But not limited to, so that the um, stated sanctions are the only possible sanctions. Is that, I mean, is that helpful is what I'm asking you? I, I believe it, it may. Okay, it may I will be. accept that then as a friendly, okay. friendly amendment. No objections to that. All right, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Arrington. I am, uh, I, mean, I guess I could support this. I, I don't really know how it's enforced. As you stated before, there was someone else that was fined and they never paid the fine. And so unless you're actually instructing finance to deduct it from someone well, that's in there. Sure. It, it will be deducted from the Fulton County compensation. Point that out, Madam County Attorney, where that is. And, and also it says up to $1,000. It doesn't say 1000 It says up to 1000 Well, let's clarify that because I wanted 10000 and she said so. Uh, huh? Why not? I mean, this is, I mean, disclosing information sometimes is, yeah. I agree, but you want to change it up to 10000 But not so strike the up to and say one thousand dollars is per offense too, isn't it? Yes. And Commissioner Arrington, the um, language about the automatic deduction is in section D of the proposed. All right. Amendment. Well, striking of the language up to would probably make me not support it. Um, but you know. I, I just have one vote. Um, I, I, I think, you know, the other thing that's missing is there are staff members that are in the meeting with us that don't report to anyone else, i.e. the county manager, the county attorney, and the clerk. And so... Like to say that there are other I think your 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 response was probably applicable to most, but not applicable to those direct appointees from the board. To to clarify, um what I meant was this amendment to the ordinance, the code section, is designed to address the commissioners because the other direct appointees, the other employees, all have someone who can enforce and whose duty it is to enforce um, adherence to county policies. So for example, should a staff member of a commissioner be present for some reason, the commissioner could discipline them. Um, should I or the, the clerk or, or the county manager or direct report to the board um, violate a county policy the board would take that up in whatever manner is appropriate, depending on on who the um, the offending party is. This so I is guess I guess I disagree with the statement that they all have someone because the board is not someone; it is something, right? And then you have to have a board action. And so I think I disagree with the statement that all other employees have someone that they report to. Um, Perhaps it's more accurate to say there is a mechanism already in place for other employees to be uh, to have violations of policy addressed when it is 
uh, applies to other employees. All right, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm ready to support this, but I'm, I'm, thank you, I'm done. no more questions for me. All right, Vice Chair Ellis. The, um, I mean, I support the spirit of this because, you know, in general, this is the way they're supposed to conduct ourselves anyway, and the rules that we're governed under. Um, I guess the piece that I struggle a little bit with, um, and I, I think the censure part is fine. Um, I don't know whether or not, I don't, I don't know, do we have the power to levy our, uh, levy fines against other elected officials? So to... I mean, and, you know, what if that gets challenged? I mean, it, to me, I mean, I would... I would, I would almost strike the monetary portions of it because I just think it's sort of a Pandora's box, even though I know you say, what's the teeth? But, you know, there are mechanisms for that, other mechanisms for that, um, with ethics bodies and that kind of stuff. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll let you respond. The, the monetary sanction was designed to mirror the sanctions that are already uh, contained in and have been previously approved by the board in the Code of Ethics? Yeah, but I, I guess sort of my question with that is, you know, if, if we were ever to get to a situation where it were to come forth and we sought to apply it, um, could you not get challenged on the fact that you and say, hey, you really don't have those powers. Those powers really, the, the finding portion rests with, the mechanism for that rests with your ethics process you already established. So it, it is redundant, it has some overlap, but uh, this body has the power to adopt policy and each commissioner um, is subject to and takes office subject to the policies, complying with the policies of the county. Um, this is not something that we would think to place traditionally in the personnel policies because it specifically applies to commissioners and therefore it is uh, presented as an amendment to the code for that reason. I just, anyway, again, I just will go on record. I think it, that component of it, I mean, we censure somebody. I mean, that's within our confines to do, right, on any sort of matter. and would be, I guess, sort of the traditional way to address, you know, that concern. Um, but then you start levying, you know, monetary penalties. Um, have you delved over in, in making yourself sort of a true... Ethics Commission, I guess, if you will, um, and sort of getting beyond your scope. I, I don't know. I mean, just I don't know if anybody else has got this kind of setup where one set of elected officials, you know, a set of elected officials will be levying a monetary fine against another elected official. I I don't I don't know that that structure exists. I mean, that's sort of the purpose for having that ethics body to be that ethics commission or ethics structure to begin with. We haven't found any authority to prevent the body from being uh, able to. I mean, I, that's not adapt really my question policy. about an authority to prevent, but it's just, you know, are there any sort of anybody else that's got this sort of structure in place? We also haven't found any um, precedent for it in another body. Okay. Mr. Chair, would you accept a friendly amendment to remove the monetary penalty from this? Uh, respectfully, no, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, Commissioner Barrett. Uh, I'm just curious about the proof part of this. If someone's accused of leaking information, what, what's the process for proving that they actually did? So because the nature of the discussion would necessarily entail discussion of the matters that were discussed in executive session, uh, this process is designed to have the discussion of the um, alleged violation and any response to that allegation uh, discussed in executive session so as to maintain the confidentiality and avoid further disclosure. And so then it's just up to the rest of the board members to decide if they believe five, it or not? Five. Yeah, okay, so five of it, the supermajority. Yes, it would have to be a supermajority of the board. Okay. Commissioner Thorne. As I am new to executive session, so forgive me, but if the DA or another elected officials back there and they leak the date, 
what's been talked about. Is there a penalty for an elected official or any type of penalty? Under this um, ordinance, no, it is not designed to uh, address other elected officials who may be present. Okay, that's All it. Right. Thank Other you. questions or comments? Right. As, as a practical matter, if I may, um, typically what has happened in my limited experience is that the official will come and make a presentation and then the candid discussion of the, um, of the commissioners can occur after they depart. It, it may not become an issue for that reason. All right, let's vote, please. And the vote is open. And motion passes, five yeas, two nays. Next item. Page eight, 22-1004, discussion, boards, authorities, commissions, and task force, sponsored by Chairman Pitts. Okay, so I've sent a uh, notice to each of you, including uh, Barron and um, Thorne, regarding boards and commissions. And the reason this is so important is because we had in excess of some, well, about 100 at one point, and we narrowed that down to 67 boards. And the problem that we are that we're facing now is that when we make appointments and people seek appointments on these various boards for all kinds of reasons, in many instances, the reasons that people want to be on these boards is they have an ulterior motive, and sometimes that can be a financial motive. We've run across that in the past. So what I'm asking is that we be really mindful and strategic about the people that we appoint, nominate rather, because the individual commissioner nominates, the approval is by the entire board, and it can be embarrassing not only to the nominating commissioner, but to the, the board of commissioners as well. So I'd ask the clerk to do some research on uh, what we have, and, and, and because the problem, one of the problems we're having now, we can't even get a quorum on some boards because the people who are on those boards simply do not attend. And it's becoming a real problem for us. Most recently, the Animal Control Board is one. Uh, there, I can give you several other examples, but Madam Clerk, what, what have you? What, okay. Um, speak up, Madam Clerk. There are currently 67 boards, authorities, commission, uh, task force in our county, um, board management system. Out of the 67, um, not all of them func are functioning. They don't actively meet. Some only meet as needed. Um, in August of uh, last year, my office sent out a survey twice to all contacts that we have on file requesting specific information, including date of their last meeting, how often they meet, and to please send us a copy of their minutes. Um, out of the, I think we had about 40 to 50 current um, contacts, we received 24 responses. So that's one of our problems too. If we send out surveys or we contact the contact person and say, hey, we need your minutes, or does your record reflect what we have? And we, all, we don't always get those responses back. Um, we depend on those officers of those boards to communicate with us when there are changes in the boards or if they have members that are not uh, attending the meetings, if they can't get a quorum, because without that, I don't have any way of knowing what's going on with each board. And this issue of resi the resignation, the resignation process came up recently. We're attempting to clarify that as well, where um, because a clerk cannot do her job if the clerk is not informed uh, by the board or authority, et cetera, or the person uh, who is in charge, i.e. the secretary. So I mean, it's gonna be incumbent upon us to, to make what I say strategic appointments to these boards. Um, so that's what this is all about. Uh, Commissioner Abdul Rockman followed by Commissioner Arrington. But it's becoming a real problem for us. And there, uh, if you go through the recent list of the 67, which I had the clerk forward to everybody, we all have vacancies, some as far back as 2020, and therefore these uh, entities cannot meet. Commissioner Abdul Rockman, followed by Commissioner Arrington. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm concerned about this as well. Um, and, and the reason I'm concerned, and I've been concerned about this a while, um, I've, I'm thinking generally, I don't know, I can only speak for my office. Uh, the people that are on the board, I try to have them to give me some type of report of what's going on, the activities. I have one particular board, I'm not gonna mention the name, but they, they haven't met in about, I think my uh, attendee, my appointee said in about six or seven months, they haven't met. And so we've got boards that are not meeting, chairman, that's an issue. The resignation process needs to be defined as to what needs to happen. Uh, because, and I, and I had a conversation with the uh, uh, chairwoman Flowers. I said, people need to have an opportunity or feel free enough to call a commissioner and say, hey, your attendee's not showing up, or hey, your attendee is doing this or that. I feel like the communication should be better because I would always want to have the best person in place, but how will I know if that person is showing up to the meetings? If they don't let me know, how will I know? Uh, are they being productive? How will I know? Are they doing stuff that's unethical? How will I know? Um, some of the boards, because of COVID, um, you know, stop meeting. Did they start back? How will I know? I've had people, because they were up in age, a lot of my appointees were up in age. And they told me, Khadija, Commissioner Khadija, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't go any further. I've got to resign. They let me know that they resigned. But I didn't know if I needed to let anybody know that they resigned. I've had a couple of this that have resigned. And so we need a comprehensive chairman overhaul because we've got people that are on boards and the boards are not meeting. We got people that are on boards that are not having conversations with the commissioner. We have people that are on boards and a certain part of the board is meeting and not the full board meeting. And so they're like, well, and, and I know sometimes it's been brought to my attention that, oh, well, they're doing stuff in executive session. Everything is not an executive session. Every item that a board has is not an executive session. And so you've got some members of the boards that are not getting the information that they should be getting as well as being the appointee of all the boards, you know, commission, commissioners. So, uh, Chairman, yes, we need a comprehensive overhaul of it. Those that are active, we need to make sure that we have something in place to make sure that the commissioners are getting the information and the ones that are not active, they need to be dissolved because it doesn't make any sense for us to have a board in place and we thinking it's a functioning board and they haven't met in almost a year. And so how do we, maybe this will need more conversation, maybe it will need some information between us and the clerk's office of what may be the best practices or whatever, but I do feel there is a need, a comprehensive need to reevaluate these boards, the ones that are not active, we need to dissolve them. The ones that are active, are they going by their bylaws? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Because there are some problems. And if our appointee is representative of us, do you know everything that your appointee is doing? And I'm, I'm saying that to, even to myself. Are we actually keeping track of our appointees and if they're showing up or not, or if they're being uh, productive for the board. And so we need something in place. Uh, I don't want to restrain any other commissioner's opportunity to have an appointee, but I just think with some of these boards, they get a little bit out of hand and they don't follow their own bylaws or rules and then the next thing you know, they're not meeting. And then the next thing you know, you've got an appointee 
that wants to resign because it's total chaos. So whatever we can do as sitting elected officials to come up with some type of uniform policy, whether it's dealing with resignations, whether it's, whether it's dealing with uh, them following their bylaws and their rules, and uh, whether it's dealing with uh, a board that has not ha had activity in quite a bit of time, we need a comprehensive overhaul uh, and a look at these bo boards. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. And to that point, uh, the county attorney, I've asked her to begin to look at this in conjunction with the clerk. Commissioner Arrington, Vice Chair Ellis, Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, I have uh, been talking about these boards, uh, authorities, commissions, task forces, uh, and the need for some overhaul. Um, the system is flawed. Um, and the reason we don't have or receive that information is because the system is flawed. Um, I think that we need to likely, my recommendation since the clerk is charged with keeping up with these boards, authorities, commissions, and task forces, we probably need to add staff, and I don't know what the number is, but I would imagine if there's 67, you probably need five or 10 people to manage 67, 67 boards. Right? I mean, you're talking about 67 boards with what, five to 10 people each? I mean, that's, all, that's 300 to 600 people that need managing. And if so, if the clerk had someone in her office that was assigned and had to attend the meeting, she wouldn't have to wait to get the minutes later. They'd be there and be recorded. It'd be right there, it'd be recorded live. we get the information in real hand. When I do my town halls, I invite the clerk. They come, they record the meeting. It's part of the record. So, you know, and then you've got, part of what you gotta do is look and see if it's a board or an authority and, and, and task force or commission. You know, God bless you. I don't know what the differences are, but I, I think authorities, are, from my understanding, and, and it could be different, are more state-created entities. And so there might be something that, a process or a policy that might need to be adopted for all authorities versus boards, task force, and commissions, which might be completely under our purview, right? And so there might need to be a different process for those different entities based upon whether it is a state entity or some other entity that is out of our control, but still I think we could have our clerk there if we give her the staff and the resources in order to make sure that people are there. And then frankly, we just need to look at all 67 boards and decide which ones, you know, make sense, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, maybe there are only 30 of them. If only 24 of them responded and only 24 of them active, <laughs> Um, you know, so we, we certainly need to look at, at, at all of that stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm open to continuing to have that discussion, but I think unless we're willing to commit resources, the other thing is, you know why people don't show up? They're not getting paid. They're not being compensated. Right? So you can't get a quorum because y'all paying. So some people on some boards get paid to go to meetings and then other people that know that people are getting paid to go to those meetings say, well, look, if they getting paid to go to their board meeting, why, 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 why would I go to mine if I'm not getting paid? And so we, we got to really do a comprehensive look at all of this stuff. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just one of the things that we need to look at comprehensively. But, um, you know, and, and, and I don't know, frankly, if, if, if we and our staff have the bandwidth to do it or whether we are too close to it to take 
the actual look that needs to be taken. So um, I'll stop there. All right, Vice Chair Ellis, and there are about 20 of those 67 that we could abolish today, just, just looking at them. So moved. <laughs> hey, <laughs> get a second. But the, I, I think really that's what it comes down to first. Let's, look, can we just take action on what we need to take action on? We've, we have this discussion a lot, of some, sometimes it's Groundhog Day type discussion. Um, sometimes, you know, the components of this are a little bit more um, valid than others. But, I mean, I think first we need to eliminate the things that aren't, aren't functional, right? And then also think, you know, anytime we add a new task force and that sort of stuff, these are particular where I think where it gets sort of a, it becomes taxing somewhat on our staff to try to follow some of these task force, really what's their purpose of them? Are they gonna do anything? Um, they obviously, many, these task forces don't really have the same teeth that you know, authority is gonna have, and, um, um, and then some of the other you know, types of formal boards we're gonna have that are you know, either set up by state law or have a really designated purpose. So let's get rid of the stuff that we don't, you know, don't need. And then another thing I think would be useful is to have uh, consider a policy for um, board members, and and see whether this could expand also to to all of our boards, whether it's an authority that we nominate somebody onto, or something like the board of assessors, and even the board of elections. If somebody didn't show up for three meetings, you know, or pick a number, whatever it is, um, that you know they will be deemed to be you know have resigned and need to be replaced and we get notice of it. Because um, I, I think that's something that we really should strongly consider um, and see whether or not, you know, because it can become a real problem if you got something like the Board of Elections where you got five members or the Board of Assessors where you got five members. If some, I mean, fortunately, I think all those have been showing up. Maybe one of them's had, you know, some members that haven't done that. But if you got a member that doesn't show up for that, this is pretty significant, right? Um, so, but you can't necessarily just revoke their role, right? I mean, I think once they're appointed, they're there, unless we have some sort of like real special thing to be able to do it. So I'd, I'd like to see us have some sort of attendance standards for the, particularly for the folks that are on, you know, things like those those authorities and those boards like assessors and elections or whatever that really play a critical, critical role. So, um, you know, and I think we need to minimize the amount of time that our staff is focused on these things and really have them focus on what we want them to focus on versus being scattershot all around on things that aren't really particularly meaningful um, to the function of our county government. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So whatever happened to the boards and authorities database that we used to have available I see you, Chad, <laughs> shaking your head. Whatever happened to that database? Because it really was very functional and helpful to all of us because it kept track of not only the appointees, but all the boards and what was going on, the meeting minutes. And, you know, it was very good at administration of all of this. Yes, Commissioner. We still have that. Uh, it's the CBMS. Unfortunately, we have to manually input that information. So if we don't have it, we can't update it. So that's where we're having the problem. I recall at one point that you were trying to purchase a system that was more automated. Whatever happened to that? Well, we're still in the process. We're actually, um, it's, it's, it's not going to work for us with the 67 boards. And it would still be a manual process to get it started to enter in the correct information. So being a former IT manager for over 20 years, um, import-export of data is very simple. It's, it's literally like click, you know, right, select and click. And but what we so, have now is not correct. So we would just be importing wrong information. Right, right. But you're in the process of correcting that information. We are trying. And yes. so the best plan of action when you're talking about a business process is re-engineering that business process in advance. So if we're going to try to 
correct all of this and get it in order, we should also be looking at replacing that database with a more automated database that can help you guys um, manage this function. Um, I think it was Commissioner Arrington who mentioned employees. Um, that is very much a need because all of these boards need an administrative person assigned to them. And I've seen where we've done things like just call on Fran Calhoun or, or Jessica or you or you know someone to administer, be like the administrative person. And that's just putting extra work on all of you when you already have enough work. So um, that is something that needs to be addressed. But also, um, I'm recalling um, Commissioner Ellis brought up one at one meeting the um, investigations of appointees to the boards. And have we addressed that as far as language is concerned? How do we handle if um, appointees are under investigation? Do they remain on the board? Do they have to come off the board? What, you know, what kind of, what do we have in writing as far as that's concerned? Um, and the chairman mentioned about people having their reasons for being appointed to the board. We've seen where some people believe that being appointed to a board is going to uh, help them prepare to run for office. So yeah, we do, you need to actually get a bio and a resume for the appointees before, and I always interview um, people who want to uh, be on these boards before making a decision. Um, but in all fairness, I think, uh, first of all, we need to make sure that our new commissioners have had an opportunity re to review all of these boards and authorities, because there are a lot. and. You know, it takes some time to actually find the people that you want to appoint to these boards. And it's very, it, it's not easy. You know, you come into public service thinking that everybody has a heart to serve and you find out that that's not necessarily the truth. So it may take time to even find the appointees, but I always have a positive outlook on everything in life. And perhaps your appointees will complete some of these boards or make them more active, because we never know who you might actually put on the boards um, that we currently have. So I'd like to you know, allow them the time to go through them themselves as well. Commissioner Barrett. All right, I'm going to try not to repeat what anybody else has said, but I do think, um, as somebody who's new, and I don't know uh, how much Commissioner Thorne has experienced this as well, but I, I know uh, the clerk's office knows that I've asked several times for these lists in different ways, and it, there is no self-service here. There is nowhere for me to go and look this stuff up. And then when it is delivered, and they have done a great job, so thank you guys in delivering all that stuff to me, but um, when they do deliver it, 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 it it's very... Um, well, you don't get all the information. So some of them, for example, will say when the thing was formed and how many members and who gets to appoint them, but it doesn't say what it does, what it's for, how often it's supposed to meet. So there's not really a summary about what these boards and commissions do. Um, and then there does seem to be really no consistency in the terms and you know, some are over when the last commissioner, you know, the, like in this case, my predecessor left, others they get to stay for another two years and then I'm sort of stuck with you know, whoever somebody else appointed, you know, those kinds of things. So I bring all that up because I, I agree with Commissioner Hall that we need an IT solution, I believe, and I, I don't know that I necessarily think we need more employees to solve this problem. If we had a really good IT solution that was more self-serve, not only for us as the BOC, but also for these various um, appointees and chairs of their boards and all of that, and I, it does seem clear to me that we need to separate the ones that are not in our control um, that are regional or state versus the ones that are in our control. But I think until we can get a complete list of who they are, what they do, why they were formed, what, you know, we can't really decide if one of them is not effective or whatever. It seems to me we need to systemize this all first. Um, I don't think it needs to be a particularly expensive system. I mean, I think there are probably some options that a good web developer could put together. I, by the way, also have an IT background, so. Uh, but it does seem to me we're not, we can have these discussions, and again, this is my first day, but from what I'm hearing these discussions have happened before, it seems to me that unless we task the county manager um, with, or, you know, or Alton with 
putting a system or putting some, some money towards putting a system in place, we're just going to continue to complain about it over and over again and not make any progress. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but it does seem to me that, that we're very behind on the eight ball here. And, and frankly, our constituents have a right to know about all these boards and what they do and who's on them as well. And it's very hard to look cur up currently uh, on the website and such. So I think that is something we should um, look at doing first. Um, I don't know, again, what that might cost, but it might be worth talking to an in-house developer to see if there's something that could be done um, that would be pretty straightforward just to be able to start to look these things up. Okay, stop laughing, Chad. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that, I just feel like maybe we can turn this into an actionable item rather than just a discussion. It, it already is. Uh, Commissioner Thorne. Um, I'll piggyback on my other IT people. Um, I, I don't believe in hiring more staff. I believe there should be some kind of cloud solution that can be implemented, even if each board task force can. I, one, I'd like to know the definition, like what's a task force, what's a committee, what's a board, how are they defined, um, what's an authority. That was a great information, and Commissioner Arrington, that there may be state, a state board. Um, and then clean them up. Um, if a commission, the, you guys, with all your experience, all the fellow, my fellow commissioners, they should know which boards they have to go back to for constituent questions and which boards are active that actually are answering to us. Uh, me and Commissioner Barrett, we, <laughs> we don't know at this point. So we would be at the mercy of everyone else to maybe clean it up, streamline the number of boards and appointments. Because for me, trying to meet with all these people that are appointed and then trying to find appointments that for people that are coming off or that I need to make because I have no appointment. I mean, it will take me months to get through to fill all those positions. So it would be helpful if we could get it cleaned up before we have to go through all that. All right. Commissioner Arrington. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just, I, I really like what uh, Commissioner Hall, Commissioner Barrett said, and even Commissioner Thorne as far as automating it. It might be as simple as putting them all on the website, on our, on our website, right, and listing all of those different things and making it available and actually even making it so people can submit their resumes online while they're looking at the, the open board seats, right? And so, that, you know, that may be a solution. I still think at the end of the day, we'll need some type of staff to manage and oversee and implement this. I mean, you, you even need staff to, to, to go look it up and get it and find out where they all are. So. I, I don't I don't know how any of this gets done without staff and then the ongoing management supervision and upkeep um, certainly I believe would, would, would need staff but um, you know I have another question and you know uh, one of the other things we need to think about is the effect of redistricting on these board appointments and who was in what district and what, where are they now and what, I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, um, I, I'll just leave it there, but I think, you know, redistricting may have some impact on these board seats and who's serving and who is the, gets to make this next appointment and all of those different things. Um, but again, maybe it is better once we can get it up on a website and have it in there and then people's, you know, contact information. If you're on a board, it's public information and, and maybe we have to create email addresses for those people, right? Because we don't want necessarily those. So um, we need someone to take a, uh, a view, a 50,000 foot view of this, I think. Um, but maybe there is a way we can get started with the website. Uh, we talk about the redistricting, and uh, again, I think we got to have, we're going to have to, there will have to be some type of staff. There's no way, even if you get it down to 20 boards, 20 boards of five to 10 people, that's, that's a lot for someone to manage. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what the man number is, but in my mind, you know, I don't know, some, probably most someone, can manage us, I don't know, five to 10 boards per person. So if we got 20 boards, 
probably need at least two to four people. Um, and maybe they're not doing that much work and maybe it's not that bad, but particularly if we're asking someone to go to those meetings and you, if, 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 if <laughs> someone's got to go to all 20 of those meetings and, and record and take notes, you're going to have to have multiple people to do that. You're going to have overlapping meetings. You're going to have people that you can't be at two meetings at one time, but elections and, and uh, reparations might be meeting at the same time. So I think we need to definitely look at that. I'm, I don't want to be the dead horse. Mr. Hall. Oh, yeah, and then the question, I'm sorry. And I guess we also need to know as far as requirements, is it a requirement that the person live in the district that's on the board? Depends on the board, right? And so we need to know which boards that depends on and which ones it doesn't. Thank you. Commissioner Hall, followed by Vice Chair Ellis, followed by Commissioner Barrett. Um, just really quick, Mr. Chair. Um, we need, we definitely need employees for the boards because of the administrative part of it. But also, it was always very cumbersome and it was hard for the clerk's office to keep track of all these boards because they already have jobs to do. And we were already talking about them having someone on their staff. Even when Chad was there before, Chad tried to help with the database that you currently had, but as you stated, it's, it, it's manual, so it took a lot of work. So definitely there's a need for employees. And as far as the system, the system can be connected to the website to feed the information directly to the website, the same way we use the dashboard the same way that the dashboard feeds the information into the website so that it's accessible to the public. So that's just, that's a very simple thing to do. And um, this absolutely has to have um, employees who manage this project because this will be a whole project for the clerk's office. Thank you. Vice Chair Ellis. I was just gonna request uh, if the county attorney could prepare a resolution dissolving uh, any 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 of these entities that's within our power to to dissolve that hasn't met within the t past 24 months to bring it and we can bring it forward to next meeting okay we will prepare it commissioner barrett i i don't think i just want to say and i won't keep beating this up because i know you want to move on but i i just think we don't it's it's not really our responsibility to go to the meeting to take notes, in my opinion. If there's a board, they can have a secretary. That person can take notes. If we appoint somebody, we should be responsible for the person we appoint. But but I think I, I'll go to Commissioner Thorne's comments on this. You know, we're getting sort of some lists with a person's name, and sometimes it's a first initial and a last name, and no contact information, and that's all we got. So we don't even know how to get in touch with these people. So if there's some kind of self-service website, where even that board itself can update and upload its minutes and update its contact information and note, post its meetings. And, and then I think that that will help with, with what Commissioner Ellis is saying, because if they're not doing that and we're requiring that of them, then they're not helpful. And we're, you know they're not active. If they're not doing the job of letting us know they're active, then they're not active. Um, and I also think I, I want to sort of focus on what Commissioner, sorry, uh, Vice Chair Ellis said uh, about whether or not they really are effective in our mandate. I mean, if we're just having a task force and a commission because it sounds good or somebody wants to be on it so they can, you know, have it on their resume, then why are we doing it? So I think if we ask them to self-report, that would be very helpful. Um, I, I, I also want to state that I do know that these boards and commissions are on the website if anyone uh, is going to point me there, but I will say that when you click on them, you pretty much just get a PDF and that's what I was saying before about those PDFs are very inconsistent with the data that's on them, so. And just one last thing, we have to remember we assign other members of our county staff to these boards like attorneys and everyone. So there is a need for oversight um, from the county level with employees and that's why we, we do it as, uh, that's why we need it. All right, any other comments on this matter? All right, again, uh, county attorney is already uh, working on this. I'll continue to work with her and the clerk, and I may ask uh, two of you in particular to, to uh, 
sort of be an unofficial working group with us to come back for some specific recommendations as well as four of the 67, uh, some that we can eliminate. Next item, Madam Clerk. Next item is the add-on item, 230023, Dream County Facility Update. Mr. Chairman, as Joe is coming up, uh, just a couple of comments. One, everybody knows that these freezing temperatures had a great deal of impact. At my own house, I had a burst pipe, so I have good first-hand uh, experience with this. But more importantly, we had 16 facilities impacted, four of which still require construction and a timeline to, to reopen. I wanted you to hear that. You should also know that we had two water mains that uh, burst in our water system in North Fulton, but they were repaired in, in pretty short order. Also a problem at JCEC, but none of that had material impact on uh, water service delivery, unlike some of the water pressure problems that you heard about uh, in Atlanta and, and uh, South Fulton. I want to give special kudos to, uh, to Joe and David Clark, as well as Michael Ross, Tim Diamond, uh, our frontline employees, uh, and our, and our uh, standby contractors. I think we underappreciate sometimes what these folks do, but when a crisis looms, they're as good as, good as anybody. And from years of dealing with uh, telephone restoration and seeing that done well, I can say our folks are equal to, uh, to anything I've ever seen before. So Joe, uh, if you will brief the board on all the myriad of, of uh, challenges that we faced and then of course the four outstanding ones that still deserve uh, a lot more work. And again, thank you, Joe, for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, and good afternoon, commissioners. As everyone is aware, uh, Friday, December the 23rd, we saw record low temperatures in a pretty short time span here in Georgia, and particularly the metropolitan Atlanta area. Uh, I know personally the morning of Friday, December the 23rd, it was 7 degrees to 8 degrees outside as I was helping put salt out at the Fulton County Jail. But those quickly decreasing temperatures led to a myriad of problems throughout many of our facilities. This presentation is intended to give you a sense of the extent of the damage, uh, what we've done to recover, of what we still have yet to do. And with that, if we can go to the next slide, please. As the county manager indicated, we had 16 facilities overall impacted, beginning with the Fulton County Jail, the North and South Service Centers, uh, two, actually three libraries, OC, Milton, and South Fulton, four senior centers, medical examiner's office, the Joyner Bridge, the Assembly Hall building, which we're in currently, also the Charles Carnes Courthouse building across the street, as well as two of our uh, regional our health centers, College Park Regional Health and the Oak Hill Family and Adolescent Child Center. Ultimately, the problems that we experienced in our buildings were due to three different reasons, all stemming from the low temperatures, but the first being fire sprinkler protection lines that burst due to, to being uh, too close to exterior walls, and thereby succumbing to the freezing temperatures. We've also had damage due to domestic water lines that burst for the same reasons, as well as HVAC coils. Now, those are the things that were impacted by our systems impacted by the cold weather. But some of the buildings on the list, as Mr. Anderson indicated, also were impacted by the low or no water pressure that we experienced pretty much across the southern half of the county. And in some cases, particularly the jail, that low water pressure actually led to subsequent damage where we were, would have been able to prevent the cracking of our HVAC coils had we had the necessary water, to warm water to send to the coils that's a freeze protection that we have in place. So it kind of exacerbated the problem. We have approximately 20,000 square feet of facility space as, as a whole damaged across the county. We are approximating our overall recovery cost to be between 1.8 and 2.2 million dollars those numbers are coming from our two standby contractors. Next slide, please. So as Mr. Anderson indicated, we have four facilities that are currently closed. Those are the Helene S. Mills Multipurpose Center, the Haightville Neighborhood Center, Senior Center, the Milton Library, and the OC Library. And as you can see, it's a combination of burst domestic water lines, sprinkler heads, as well as an HVAC coil. Next slide, please. So here at the Helene S. Mills Multipurpose Center, uh, the pictures that you see are somewhat post-recovery. 
For those that are familiar with the building, the first picture in the upper right left quadrant, that's our main lobby. The carpet has been removed. Uh, the picture just below that is the multipurpose hall. The wood flooring has been removed. Every picture that you see, all of those areas were literally under anywhere from three to four inches of water and for varying time frames. At this particular facility, we had three domestic water lines that were all located on exterior walls uh, that burst as a result of the low temperatures. So as of today, uh, all the flooring has been removed in the affected areas. Uh, the drying or dehumidification process of this facility has been completed. And we're actually starting drywall replacement uh, in this facility as well as others to recover the building. One of the things that we're going to have to do moving forward, particularly in this facility, is not only source the replacement carpet for the carpeted areas, but we now have an opportunity to make a decision as to whether or not we want to go back with a wood floor in the multipurpose hall. The reason we say that is because, of course, the recovery cost, as well as time frame, is much more extensive with wood flooring versus some other floor material, whether it be uh, what we commonly call LVP, or luxury vinyl tile, or vinyl plank, rather, or whether we go with vinyl composite tile, whatever the case may be, uh, we think there's a decision opportunity here to decide whether or not we want to mitigate the overall exposure down the road with the decision in that regard. The Helene S. Mills Multipurpose Center, uh, just to give you a sense of the extent of the damage, the entire adult day side of the facility was underwater. Um, there is no part of that portion of the building that, uh, outside of the kitchen with the hard floor, that still has flooring in place. Like, like I said before, it has been dried out thoroughly, and we are now waiting on carpet selections and time frames from our respective res restoration contractors, subcontractors, or providers to give us a timeline. And before I go any further, let me state that in each and every case, it is our intent to be as aggressive as humanly possible with regards to the recovery of the building being done properly and to the latest environmental standards, but most importantly as it relates to the service delivered to the citizens and the public. So we are not quite sure at this point this afternoon or this evening, I'll be hearing from the contractor responsible for this facility as it relates to timelines on flooring, which will give us a much better sense of where we stand with regards to reopening, at which point we'll communicate that up through our normal channels so you all be kept abreast of what's going on. Next slide, please. The Hateville Neighborhood Senior Center. If you see the first picture that says fitness room, and you can see the reflection of the water there on the floor as well as in the meeting activity room to give you a sense of how much water was in the building. This was the result of two sprinkler heads blowing in that fitness room. In this particular case, and unfortunately I wasn't around when the building was built, but when you go into this fitness room, it looks like it was a post general construction add-on to the building. And as a result, it's not on the building's central air system, heating and air system. You see what's not pictured is what looks to be a, what we call a PTAC unit up on the wall that only activates when the room has been in use. As a result, that did not go into operation during the time of the holidays. We had these two uh, lines burst, and it sent an inordinate amount of water uh, throughout the facility. What you'll see, again, as you can look at the meeting or activity room, the amount of water that's on the floor there, the two hallway pictures at the bottom, um, one, you can see where the water actually accumulated in the hallway. What you can't see in the other picture, which is the opposite direction, is the amount of water that goes all the way down to where the two pictures are in the background, two persons are in the background of that picture. Uh, but we are still in the process, similar to everything else. We've removed all the flooring, all the drying has been done, and I guess it's enough to take this opportunity to explain. This is a two-fold process. You first, before you can move forward, have to dry out the facility. Once the facility is dried out, you can then begin the actual physical recovery of the building. And so in all cases, our buildings are now dry, and we are actually beginning the replacement of drywall at this facility today through our contractor. And we will have a little bit more information as of this evening with their progress today when we can expect to be reopened. Um, but I don't anticipate that this particular facility will be open until probably Monday of next week at the earliest, but again, we'll keep you updated as we progress in our efforts. 
Next slide. Robert Fulton Library at OC, burst HVAC coil. You'll see here these pictures that the amount of water that's on the floor, as well as the damage that occurred in the main lobby from ceiling tiles. The affected, the, the unit that impacted this facility was on the second floor above or mezzanine level. We've completed the drying and dehumidification process. Uh, the com contractor that's servicing that building is actually going back out this afternoon. It is ultimately our goal, based upon what we have seen and done thus far, to open this building tomorrow. Um, working with many people, we've decided that there is an alternate path of travel in this facility that we can enter from a side door, directing the public to that door, and then being able to bypass the damaged areas. There's not a large portion of the collection section of the library impacted in this facility, so we set an aggressive target of Thursday. However, again, this is subject to field conditions, and we'll know more this afternoon, but it is our plan to try to open tomorrow. Next slide, please. The Milton Library, three sprinkler heads along the exterior wall, um, which is the exterior glass wall, all burst, uh, affecting probably about 40 to 45 percent of the library. Um, we have done a lot of work in this particular case to remove um, the water as well as the drying and dehumidification of the building. One of the things that's causing a little bit of a uh, hiccup in our overall plan is there's a lot of floor outlets in this particular library that as of yesterday we found a significant amount of water. We are trying to make sure that those are dry so that we don't have any electrical issues as we move forward. At this particular library, if you'll notice the two pictures on the left hand side, those plastic tubes, that is connected to a huge truck mounted dehumidification device outside the building to help speed up the um, drying out of the facility. But Ultimately, as with regards to next steps, we've got some inventory and packing to do of the collections area that was impacted so that we can move the racks, remove the flooring under the racks, restore drywall, but we are projecting Monday, January the 9th, uh, subject to field conditions to reopen the facility. Now, I want to give you guys an idea or understanding of what reopen the facility actually means in our terminology. It doesn't mean the facility is completely aesthetically recovered. It means that it has been recovered physically, mechanically, and that there still may be some carpet to reinstall. There still may be some other minor cosmetic things that we have to address, but the goal is to get the library back open in a safe manner for the public. Next slide, please. So this is actually one that I'm rather proud of. This is the assembly hall building. This is, we typically tend to think of the assembly hall as just this chamber here, but to my right here upstairs, where I see the assembly hall reception area, that was literally a picture of the water flowing like a waterfall out of the ceiling from a burst fire sprinkler line. The entire hallway or walkway right behind us here at the top was underwater. The entire hallway all around me here, underwater. Uh, as you can see, the office that's destroyed, that's in my department dream in the basement. This water that's in this hallway is also on the far wall going into the tax commissioner's office. So this was an extensive event, and with the exception of the tax commissioner's area that's shown in this picture, uh, everything, it, oh, I'm sorry, the dream office, we've cleaned it up but not fully repaired. But our focus was to get this room ready. You would not believe from the day this occurred, all the carpet has been dried, all the carpet has been replaced, with the focus of being, having this chamber and the use of it for today's meeting to not be interrupted. So we are continuing to do the work. All areas that were affected by this particular burst are open, available for use. As in all cases, still some cosmetic work to do in certain areas, but we're gonna progress. We have a wonderful relationship with the contractors, the two standby contractors that are doing the work, and they have taken our direction extremely well and have been committed to the overall job. Next slide. So additional facility issues are listed here. I won't take the time to go through them all, but it's a combination of the things that we've discussed as it relates to fire alarm lines, HVAC coils, and domestic water lines. I would like to say that in every facility that was impacted, all mechanical repairs that were necessitated have been made. We're just now in physical and aesthetic recovery mode. With the exception of the Fulton County Jail, we still have two HVAC coils that must be replaced. However, those are not going to impact our ability to provide environmental comfort to the facility. 
One thing that's not listed for the jail that I know is important to the sheriff, we have three elevators currently down in housing, which limits them to want the use of just one. Um, mm -hmm. As a result of a burst line, the control boards that are in the elevator pits got wet. The day this occurred, our vendor told us that over 100 elevators were shut down in the city due for the same reason. We're waiting on an ETA for them to get us new uh, electronic controllers. And uh, in the meantime, the sheriff is having to make some modifications. But other than that, um, these are all the facilities that were impacted during the overall winter event. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? What can we do to prevent this from happening in the future? Number one, notification to end users leave faucets running. That's the number one thing that we all do in our homes. It's the same scenario here in the county. Another thing is identify specific locations, meaning at the mill center, what is the best faucet to leave running so that we provide the greatest amount of protection with the least amount of effort and identifying that on a facility by facility basis. Lastly, nextly, uh, next we have the fire sprinkler lines. Fire code prevents us from putting heat tape and things of that nature around fire sprinkler lines. So what we're gonna do is explore what they do in the north where they have to combat these problems all the time. Our systems are built and not designed uh, the way they do in the north and that is can we put, for lack of a better term, antifreeze in the line? What modifications do we need to make to our systems to allow us to add an anti-freezing agent to our fire sprinkler lines in the future? That is something our team is working on as well. And lastly, what can we do to improve our overall response time? That is, from the time the alarm goes off in E911 and who gets called and when and so forth, right now what we experienced during this event was that the local fire departments and those respective jurisdictions were notified immediately. But no one in DREAM was notified, whereby we could have possibly stemmed some of the damage had our team been notified immediately. So we're gonna do a process review to make sure that we have the right hierarchy in place. We're gonna pull all together, all stakeholders together, and work on that and determine what our response plan and escalation protocol should be. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Anderson alluded to it, but I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, out of all the people that worked, he mentioned uh, frontline staff, but there were two in particular. These are our building maintenance supervisors for our Central Fulton area and our Greater Fulton area, uh, Benjamin Wright for Central and Patrick Ent for our Greater Fulton area. Those two individuals literally sacrificed both holidays, uh, both Christmas Eve, Christmas, day after, same for New Year's, to not only help in the response, but also to facilitate the uh, speedy recovery. And I just wanted to call out and commend them for their efforts. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, got a line up here. Uh, Commissioner Abdu Rockman, followed by Commissioner Thorne. And it is 316, Commissioner. Uh, Chairman, I'll make my uh, comments very quick. You know, a lot of times uh, we often come to you and tell you when you're doing stuff wrong. I want to take this time openly, county manager, as well as Dream. Um, you all did a wonderful job in your response in mitigating. I got calls from not only employees, but neighbors, individuals that saw what was going on and called the fire department or whatever, you know, and for you all to react so quickly and to mitigate what you could mitigate and to get open what you could, it was unprecedented in the temperatures. But this was not isolated. This happened all over Georgia. And we still have some jurisdictions that are really hurting from this because they were not prepared. They were not be able to act. And more importantly, they were not able to reopen. And so what I wanted to do was to thank you all because you all really did a top-notch job in jumping on all those things. It's not like they... It's not like Milton did it and then Hateville did it. You know, they didn't do it in, in succession at, at all. At, they may have done it all at one time. They didn't wait to happen. And that takes some stellar teamwork, some very great leadership to get on top of that, to control that, and more importantly, mitigate it. And I just wanted to openly tell you all, not only the ones that you mentioned, but everyone did a great job. And I, for one, appreciate what you all did. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Commissioner. You, Commissioner. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Thorne. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I also want to thank you. I, I assume you had a very Merry Christmas <laughs> holiday. <laughs> Probably need a holiday again. Maybe we can give you a few days around Martin Luther King. Um, you mentioned that in the buildings like the Helen Mills multipurpose that the domestic water lines were put in exterior walls. When you repaired them, did you just repair them back in the walls where that might happen again? Um, you said in the, that fitness room that it only had motion sense heat. You know, has that problem been mitigated to keep maybe a baseline temperature in that room to prevent freezing? Um, and then you said, I think in uh, Milton Library, that sprinkler heads were in a glass wall that was easily frozen. So I was just wondering, I imagine, I'm from up north, Illinois, mm -hmm. we have freezing temperatures all the time. Um, I don't, I've never known of someone to have a burst pipe. Um, so I just wonder if is it builders down south that they just have different codes and when we fix the problems, did we just fix the problem but didn't fix it for a future freeze? Those are all very good questions, Commissioner. Here in the south, we do build things to a different standard because we don't have the consistent average temperatures that you have in, say, Illinois or no further north. But as it relates to those lines in the mill center that were domestic water lines, we purposely intended when, when we facilitated just simply the replacement of the pipe, not only were we replacing the broken pipe or burst pipe, we're insulating those pipes, not only direct insulation around the water pipes, but also in the wall itself to provide a level of protection that we currently don't have. There's not too many things that we can do in the cases of the fire sprinkler lines. However, we do know that antifreeze or glycol is used in northern design, and we're now researching how we can add a uh, device on our fire pump that would allow us to add these chemicals to our existing fire lines. Uh, I've been personally doing some research in that and now have a game plan for which I'm gonna ask for our engineers to, to tell me what it's gonna take from a mechanical perspective to do, and then figure out what that cost is gonna look like so that we can have a, a discussion about capital funding for a project of that nature. Not much we can do about the design of the building where the lines are run because they're run where they need to be based on current code. However, how we run the water through the lines is another story. So they're gonna remain on the exterior wall, glass wall, because it's about 18 inches from this glass wall. Of course, glass doesn't necessarily provide the greatest level of insulation, but what we put through the pipe, we could potentially affect that. So it's going to be a pretty enormous endeavor, but we're going to have to systematically go from building to building and identify what has to happen and what we can do and what that cost is, and we're already on top of that now. And then one more thing, I actually had people reach out to me wondering if this was going to be covered by taxpayer dollars or if we have insurance that covers these repairs. This is going to be, in every case, I'm not the one that makes the ultimate determination, but we are filing risk claims as the county is self-insured and the risk fund will be funding or paying for the damages, to the best of my knowledge. But Ms. Whitmore may have some more. Yeah, we do carry property insurance. So um, to the extent that um, the carrier agrees to cover it, we'll submit the claims uh, for reimbursement. We'll probably incur the cost up front in order to um, uh, complete the full uh, restoration, recarpeting, and the aesthetics aspect of it, and then um, seek reimbursement through the insurance carriers, um, less the deductibles for, for each of the facilities. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, let me just say that dream has been a dream that has brought our dreams to light because I had, by the looks of, <laughs> you are cracking up laughing, because by the looks of everything, there's no way that anyone could have ever told that all of this destruction happened. So I wanna commend you guys on, on what you've done. It's amazing work. And I'm so sorry that you missed your holidays because you really deserve them after this. And I, I agree with Commissioner Thorne. Maybe we can give you some extra time for a holiday. Um, but the question comes to mind of how does emergency management work in conjunction with DREAM in situations like this? 
what I would tell you, and it's going to sound like a very simple answer, but throughout this entire event, I was in constant contact with Matthew Callmeyer, who reached out to determine was there any needs that we had, was there anything that they could do to assist us. Um, we, we, we talked about what the overall recovery cost was going to be, trying to go after some federal dollars for it. So from my perspective as a facilities person, emergency management did what it was supposed to. It reached out, it extended a hand, and where we could, they would lend it. So I'm trying to understand if emergency management was in communication with DREAM, how does this last bullet point function uh, next to the last page that says assess existing notification system, evaluate current alarm notification technology to ensure all needs are met. Um, because it seems like DREAM would have been that part of that, notif that emergency alarm notification process. So uh, it's important to know. I mean, I'm sorry, emergency management would have been part yes, of that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's important to note that emergency management does not house the alarm system. It's actually emergency services, or E911. And that is where we are going to take a look at the process, particularly as it relates to our sprinkler lines. When they blow, it sends an alarm signal because it's the same signal that would be received in the event of a fire. At that point, that signal goes to E911, where they are then trained to call the fire department who will be the first responder on the scene. What we need to focus on now is that there needs to be a dual action there. It's call the fire department and call DREAM as well so that we can get the ball rolling. So what we've decided that we want to do is to bring these two entities together, DREAM, E911 leadership, yes. take a look at the overall functionality of that system and we as well as the process and figure out where the process either fell short or where we had gaps, and yes. then plug those. Thank you, because you know if you've watched me over the years, my IT mind yes, works like a flow chart. So I'm already I've already started this flow chart of core addressing natural disasters, and to me this is a natural disaster with all this flooding and pipes yes, bursting. And so now I'm like, okay, core emergency management, E911, Dream. That's a process that really needs to be solidified and put in place for these situations. So I'm glad to hear that you're on that track. Um, also, um, the first bullet that speaks to notifications to end users to leave faucets running inside and outside, and you kind of, you, um, you kind of refer to that as that needs to happen in our county buildings uh, the same way that residents are notified and need to do it. Yes, but it made me think about the fact that there was a time when we used to assign um, a person for every floor or every department for emergency evacuations. I don't know who that is anymore. Um, but will there be a person who will be responsible to be notified to carry out the process of turning all the faucets on, or will that person be dispatched from your team or core or emergency management? How, how will that work? What I will tell you is that the sheer volume of buildings that we have, as well as the 70 mile geographical just it's distance, uh, is more than what just a dream could cover in and of itself. Yeah. So the goal is, the county manager and I had a discussion about this, and so similar to the issue with the computerized portion of this, we want to put together a team that's going to evaluate what is the actual best way to accomplish this in mass. How do we do this? And it's going to inevitably be a partnership between DREAM and the police department and uh, potentially the sheriff's office as well as the various user departments so that we can figure out what is the best way to ensure complete coverage across the county. Again, that is something in progress All right. that we have decided that we need to create, pardon the pun, our own task force to, uh, to, to address. All right, thank you so much. Great work, very commendable. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank Madam you. Clerk.
No further items. All right, no further items to come before us. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. 3.28 p.m. For a written transcript of this meeting, or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the clerk to the commission's office at 404-612-8232. Thank <laughs> you.